All right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's much-anticipated debate on end times theology. This is the Great Rapture Debate, and this is one of my favorite topics, so it is a privilege to have two well-versed, well-studied, and, and knowledgeable individuals to debate this important topic, Pastor Tommy McMurtry and Nick Sayers. We are specifically engaging the question, is the pre-tribulation rapture biblical? Nick Sayers would say yes, and Pastor Tommy McMurtry would say no. I look forward to uh, seeing what uh, points, what the debaters tonight are going to bring to the table. So uh, before we get into opening statements, though, let's let's get acquainted, kind of break the ice as we like to do here on Standing for Truth and get to know our guests a little bit. Uh, Pastor Tommy McMurtry, why don't we start with you? Uh, last time you were here, I think a couple months ago now, uh, you had an excellent debate, a comprehensive debate. I think it went almost three and a half hours with uh, Pastor Anthony Aquino. And so it's great to have you back. How have you been? And for anybody unfamiliar with who you are, a little bit about yourself. Yes, my name is Pastor Tommy McMurtry, and I've been pastoring the Liberty Baptist Church in Rock Falls for, uh, it'll be 12 years in September. And I am a husband of my wife, Cassandra, to my wife, Cassandra, and we have eight children together, ranging in ages from 21 to two, and um, love the subject of end times. I've always been interested in it. Um, ever since I was young, uh, I remember watching the Left Behind movie when it first came out, got super excited about that, went and read all the books, and I uh, used to be 100% in the pre-trib camp, but then I loved listening to prophecy sermons, and I noticed nobody preached it the same. Nobody. So I tried to find some consistency in there, couldn't, and uh, about nine years ago, I uh, came to the conclusion that Pre -triver, the pre-trib rapture does not hold up, and uh, here we are today. So hope uh, looking forward to this discussion, and hope it's uh, encouraging and somebody learned something tonight. Absolutely. That's why we do these discussions and these debates in order to help people learn about these uh, important topics. So, Tommy, I appreciate the uh, introduction. Again, it's good to have you back. Anybody who wants to see more from our debaters, if you like what you're hearing from Tommy, from Nick, please do check the description box of this video. You'll find the uh, relevant links to their websites and also their YouTube channels. Nick Sayers, good to have you as well. Last time you were here, I believe now about a month ago, you had a great debate on uh, the King James issue with, with Turretin fans. So always a pri uh, privilege. And uh, why don't we hand it to you for a brief intro, how you been, and also, uh, Nick, a little bit about yourself. Hey, guys. Yeah, I've been um, diving into the eschatology issue for the last uh, few months, and I'm really enjoying it. I've been listening to um, Tommy's uh, Revelation series and a few other guys listening to Donnie's series. And um, I, I'm coming from a pre-trib position. And so my position, I in the church I got saved in, they were pre-trib. Now, when I left that church, it was a little bit cultic. They were um, very dominant in their leadership and things like that. So when I left, I questioned everything. I went through absolutely every doctrine and I threw out the junk, the, the legalism and things like that, the traditions of men. And I kept what I could say, I firmly believe this is biblical. Now, the pre-trib rapture is something that I believe is 100% biblical. I believe I can defend it. And I think every other view that I've come across just doesn't hold up to the word of God. And so uh, me personally, I've been a Christian since 1995. I've been to Papua New Guinea 13 times. Many times I preach eschatology on the streets. Uh, a lot of people there are very interested in, in last days and things like that. I lived for a year in Pakistan, um, a very amazing place. Where I was able to uh, preach in crusades and things like that there. Uh, lots of open people. Um, there's a harvest field in Asia, guys. If you want to go to Asia, go to Pakistan, go to India, it is so open. There are so many people thirsty for the word of God there. But um, anyway, so that's me. I'm just a normal sort of guy, but I love Jesus and I uh, love street preaching and um, love the pre-trib rapture doctrine. Nick, thank you very much for the introduction again to the audience. If you want to see more from 
uh, what Nick and Tommy are putting out in terms of content. Do check the description box for links to their uh, the, the, the relevant links to their channels and websites. Okay, so with the introductions out of the way, uh, Pastor Tommy and Nick, I appreciate it. Uh, let's go over the format briefly, and then we'll jump into the first opening statement for tonight's great rapture debate. So we're going to have um, 15 minute opening statements. So we want to be comprehensive, uh, as I think is important with a debate this, uh, this heavy. Uh, and then we're going to have eight minute uninterrupted rebuttals. And then we're going to jump into a discussion. So this is going to be a uh, mo more of a free-flowing discussion rather than a real strict cross-exam. We'll go probably about 45 minutes. We'll see how uh, we are doing in terms of what's being discussed. Then we'll have a five-minute concluding statement where uh, Nick and Tommy can wrap up their thoughts and points. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We will have a roughly 30-minute audience question and answer period. We always get a ton of questions for these debates on end times theology. And it's great to see so much excitement and engagement on these, these topics. So if you do have a question, please just make sure you're tagging me uh, either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. That way I won't miss your question. Just let me know who the question's for, Tommy or Nick, and we'll have a great audience Q&A. So with that, let's get right into the first opening statement. Nick Sayers, you being in the affirmative tonight, we are going to hand it over to you. I'll give you a one-minute warning, Nick, when you get to the 14-minute mark, and that way you'll know to kind of start winding things down a little bit. Whenever you're ready, Nick. Cheers, Donnie. Thanks. So I believe that when people die, they don't automatically go to heaven. So when Stephen was getting big rocks thrown at his head, he said, I see the son of man standing at the right hand of the father. And so he saw the rapture of the church. So a lot of people think in their mind, usually it comes from funerals and things like that. They say, oh, they're in a better place, you know, and this, uh, the church had some pretty muddled eschatology for quite a while. And so a lot of people thought, well, they've died or they've gone to heaven. But being stri strictly biblical, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So um, a lot of people think when you die, oh, you go straight to heaven. And then at the rapture, your body catches up with you or something like that. It's going to be pretty hard for these Christians who were burnt alive like candles in the Roman era. Um, their bodies are probably just dust now. What's a bunch of dust going to float up there? And they're like, oh, this is great, you know. Um, so when people die, they don't automatically go to heaven. They go to the rapture. And so there is uh, a huge difference with opinions upon that um, with uh, me and Tommy. So if we read Revelation 4.1, now Revelation 4.1, um, it says, and after this, so this is, what Jesus did is he divided the book of Revelation up into three parts. The things that you have seen, he says this in chapter one, the things that you have seen. So chapter one, John had seen Jesus, eyes of fire and all that sort of stuff. He says, write the things which are. So there were the seven churches in chapters two and three. And then he said, and write the things which shall be hereafter or meta tafta in the Greek. Now, two times this, this term meta tafta appears in Revelation chapter four, verse one. So it says, after this, um, I looked and behold, a door uh, open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. And he said, come up hither and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. So hereafter is again metatafta. So it has metatafta twice there. So the hereafter and after this. So it's quite interesting. There's a door open in heaven. Jesus is the door. Um, we, we learned that in, uh, John wrote that himself. Um, and then it says the first voice, which is Jesus, he says, come up here. Now, uh, Donnie actually taught me something the other day that about the trumpet here, it's actually lifting up your voice like a trumpet because I used to say, well, it's, it's a trumpet, you know. But um, I'm glad that um, I learned something from Donnie. I'm going through his eschatology series at the moment and I'm open to change. I'm open to looking at everything and correcting my position. This is the only thing I've corrected, by the way. Um but it says come up hither and if we read in revelation chapter 11 when the two witnesses are taken up it's the exact same greek word but it's in the plural because there's two of them and it says uh, come up hither and they were and they were raptured in front of the whole world so obviously this is a rapture now it isn't the rapture now we believe there's two things that happen here this is symbolic of the rapture 
Um, what you've got to understand is it's what happens afterwards that proves that the rapture has already happened. So John is taken up into heaven. He sees 24 elders. Now, if you read through the book of Revelation, you can see the new Jerusalem, which is us. It's the church. It's all the uh, resurrected saints. Um, and we are the new Jerusalem. Now, it says that we have on us the names of the 12 apostles and over the gates, um, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So to me, this makes perfect sense. It's the 12 and 12. You just do the math. It's 24. So to me, the 24 elders make up of 12 of the tribes of Israel and 12 of the um the disciples of Christ. And so um, they're elders, they're old, they're older than us. You know, they're, they're uh, I know uh, there's a few people who say they're pastors and other people say they're, they're legendary characters in, in the past and all that. But um, the, the Bible does say this. So my, my position is very biblical from the book of Revelation. And so it says John gets, uh, he's in heaven and he sees these. Now, if these are the, um, the apostles, he's actually looking at himself, which is quite amazing. So if we go to Revelation chapter 5, this is where it gets really interesting. It says, <clears throat> um, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials filled with odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. Has redeemed us. now the new new version so has redeemed them or has redeemed mankind so that they they destroy you know doctrines left right and center all the way through um but it says has redeemed us to god by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation okay so this is quite interesting because i've heard a lot of the time um the post-trib guys they're saying that when it says every tongue and language and people and nation in um, Revelation chapter 7, oh, see, that's the rapture. It's everywhere. Well, it's, it's clearly saying here that they have redeemed us. Who's the us here? So you, um, and then it says uh, in verse 10, it says, Revelation 5.10, and has made us kings and priests. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 1, you can clearly see that John says in Revelation 1.6, and has made us kings and priests under God. So this is for the Christians. He's made Christians kings and priests. So if we go back to Revelation um, chapter 5. It says, he hath made us kings and priests. So again, that us has changed in the modern Bible, so it destroys the doctrine. And then it says, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay. But look at the very next verse. It says, I behold and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So there's all these angels. What we've just read in the book of Revelation is Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and I'm sure Tommy would agree with me with this, is that an angel can actually be a human. And so uh, it says, you know, write to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write this and write that. So, um, you know, I heard Tommy in his series say, oh, this is probably just the pastor or a messenger of the church. And even John the Baptist, it's the same Greek word when it says, uh, I send my messenger before thy face. It's the word messenger is angel, angelos. So we could say here, we could say, um, I beheld the voice of many messengers around the throne. Or um, the Bible is very clear that in, um, the re in the regeneration, we shall be like angels. We will not procreate. And so when you go through Revelation chapter uh, 4, you've got you know, John, this sim symbology of the rapture. There's the 24 elders. There's people saying, you've redeemed us. We are kings and priests. And this is all pre-trib. So I, I, would I would advise people to read through Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 very, very carefully. Now, one of the main things in going through this whole concept of after the tribulation, after the tribulation, John MacArthur, he conflates the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, Okay. So he conflates these two terms, and we would all think that that's heresy doing that. I don't know why he does it. He's just got this infatuation with doing that. Um, but in a similar way, what I find is um, these post-trib guys are actually conflating when it says the moon turned to blood. They say, oh, that's in Matthew 24. But it doesn't say that in Matthew 24. It says the sun shall be turned to darkness. And so, uh, sorry, the, the moon shall be darkened. Sorry, I, I just got to be confused with the sun and the moon there. It says the moon shall turn to blood in the book of Revelation chapter 6, 
But if you re read Matthew 24, it just says it will be darkened, the moon, after the tribulation of those days. It says the same in Luke 21. It says the same in Mark 13. It doesn't say the moon will turn to blood. But when you listen to these guys talk, they just conflate everything together and say the moon being darkened means the moon turned to blood. I mean, to me, having John MacArthur conflate the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus creates all sorts of problems. I think these guys, by conflating darkness with blood here, with the moon, um, it's it's creating a whole bunch of theological problems. And it's what it's doing, it's ruining the timeline. If you have a wrong timeline, it's pretty hard to do anything. Like if I was to say, because today it's probably maybe about 20 degrees here in Australia. Now, in America, they're like, 20 degrees, that's freezing. Well, it's just sort of like a spring day here. It's a little bit chilly, but um, you, you have to have the right measurements, you know, Celsius and Fahrenheit and things like that. What I find with the um, post-trib guys is they they are moving goalposts for starters. So Matthew 24, instead of being the final uh rapture that happens because there's seven resurrection raptures that happen in the book of revelation i'll go through them um instead of being the final one they make it the first one and by twisting this whole concept of the, the moon turning to blood and, and and by conflating this so they twist it all around so you, you've gone to kick a goal and there's no more goals there and then uh, what happens is they get the book of revelation and they fold it in half and so this is very convenient because in my eschatology, there is tribulation that happens at the beginning of the seven years. There's tribulation that happens um, in the middle. There's tribulation that happens at the end. It's all the way through the seven years. But these guys, by folding the book of Revelation in half and sort of just you know, grabbing bits here and there and just squeezing it in to Revelation um, chapter six and seven, what happens then is you say, oh, what about the, the people who overcome um, the mark of the beast? And you know, oh, well, you know, that, that's just what happens in Revelation chapter six. Everything's just sort of piled up on, on top of each other. So it's a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. And instead of actually doing the puzzle like in a neat and orderly fashion, and like with the book of Revelation having a seven year period, you know, going through it chronologically, they fold it over. And then what well, it's like getting the pieces of the puzzle, like you've got a tree there and you're stacking them on top of each other. And it just creates confusion. And so the timeline is all out of whack. And so oftentimes we're talking past each other because we're saying different chronological things. And so um, I find um, most post-trib pre-wrath guys, I, I say, oh, the great tribulation. And they're like, yeah, but Jesus said we'll go through daily tribulation. It's like... <laughs> Why are you conflating the great tribulation, the, the period of great tribulation, with just daily tribulations? Jesus clearly said, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So obviously, this is a different time of tribulation. And so oftentimes you hear them say, oh, these stupid pre ratha guys, they're saying that, um, you know, we won't go through tribulation. But Jesus said, rejoice in tribulation. John said, I'm your companion in tribulation. You know, it's like, why are you conflating just daily tribulations with the great tribulation that will never, ever be again and never has been? You know, what, why are you doing that? Um, and so oftentimes, too, we see people um, miss... Uh, interpreting things. So the Bible clearly says in Revelation chapter one, he's to show these servants things which must shortly come to pass. And then you hear people say, oh, you know, there's no imminency in the Bible. The word shortly here actually means immediately or suddenly. It's the word suddenly. It's the word tacos, which means um, a, a, a very fast thing. So it's a wrong definition straight from the beginning. As soon as you're reading Revelation. Um, and so it's uh, people are assuming it means a chronological duration. You know, I'm, I'm coming soon, but Jesus didn't come soon. Um, he has 2,000 years. Oh, 1,000 years is like a day to him and all this sort of stuff. Uh, no, it's actually talking about the speed. When you go through the uh, and study this word in the Bible, it's often translated as, as instantly. You know, suddenly this happened. Uh, Luke says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 7, rise up quickly, suddenly, immediately. So the whole concept of imminency is right there in the beginning of the book of Revelation. But, you know, if you want to um, mistranslate words, I mean, it doesn't take much to grab an Oxford English Dictionary or a Webster's or something. You look these things up or do a quick word study. 
Um, and so what I find too is a lot of these guys are saying you once saved, always saved. Okay. Now I am not once saved, always saved. I want to make that very clear from the get go. Now people will say, oh, you're working your way to heaven. Um, no, I believe I'm saved by the blood of Jesus, but I abide in Christ. Now, some people say, like, say, there's this guy, I don't want to mention his name, but um, he is in uh, the United States and he teach, he goes door to door, and which is fine, but he tells people once they've put their faith in Christ that even if they were to commit suicide, that he doesn't recommend they do it, but even if they were to do it, they would go to heaven, okay? So to me, if I was once saved, always saved, rather than going through all this tribulation, I would just simply get a gun and go bang and go straight to heaven. If you saw these things coming to pass, it'll be like, well, I'm just going to run down and grab a gun. I'm going to shoot myself because I've got a heaven anyway. And so it's interesting that um, some of these new IFB guys uh, teach, you know, you can't lose your salvation. One um, minute. You can commit suicide and go straight to heaven. I mean, if you saw the worst time ever, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be like one of the Jews in World War II. It's a Warsaw Ghetto style thing. You want to go through that? I don't. <laughs> it's like, oh, but you'll get rewards and you know. You just want to go to heaven. <laughs> and so to, to me, a lot of these doctrines that they overlap each other and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't say that the first horse is the Antichrist. It doesn't say that anywhere. It's just a white horse. Oh, it's the Antichrist, you know. So matching that up with Revelation 13 in the big fold, it, it's, it doesn't literally say that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other things that I want to say, but I think that'll come out as we continue through. Okay, that is your 15-minute opening statement, Nick. Thank you very much. To the audience, I am all caught up on your questions. Thank you for uh, tagging me and fantastic questions already. Okay, so Pastor Tommy McMurtry, we're going to hand it over to you now for your 15-minute opening statement. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. All right. Well, um, I am excited about being here. I'm excited about that this discussion I do want to start out saying I love my pre-trib brothers. Um, I was not aware until a few days ago uh, that Nick is not once saved, always saved. And um, I had already agreed to this and I was really disappointed. I was kind of hoping it wasn't going to come up because um, no matter what happens in this debate now, all my pre-trib friends are going to be like, oh, this guy doesn't even believe once saved, always saved. And that's, that's a discussion for another day. But um, man, yeah, that's really disappointing. And um, so when I talk about pre-trib, my pre-trib brothers, I'm talking about my fellow independent fundamental right on salvation Baptists. I I love them. I do not hate any of them for being pre-trib. Uh, the difference between pre-tribbers and post-tribbers uh, post are differences we should be able to live with. And where the Bible clearly teaches we should draw lines, I believe pre-tribbers are definitely in those lines. And, um, and so again, when I talk about pre-tribbers and I, I'm, I'm referencing the, the good ones, the saved ones. Um, uh, they're the ones I'm trying to reach Nick. I don't obviously have no idea where you're from, uh, not believing once saved, always saved, believing that we don't go straight to heaven when we die, even though the Bible says to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. Um, uh, man, you're, you're kind of getting worse than Ruckmanites there, but um, maybe we can have a conversation about those things on another day. But um, I do want to hit 2 Timothy 2.15 before Nick does, where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. This is why we need to rightly divide. And their word will lead us to the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past and overthrow the faith of some. Now, many people, they read rightly dividing and they automatically think dispensationalism. And you know why? Because Larkin's got a great big chart early in the book, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is where they get their stuff. I saw our friend SoCal Preston saying that charts should be mandatory in these things. And I think that is absolutely wrong. I believe the charts are doing more damage and getting the conversation farther away from the Bible than anything. Everyone is fighting for their charts, for their books, and every one of the every chart I've ever seen, including post tribbers, are all influenced by Larkin. He has done more to muddy the waters than anyone. And people, 
They will misuse this passage in 2 Timothy 2.15 to nail anyone who's different than them on eschatology. But the false teaching was that the resurrection was past. Pre-tribbers and post-tribbers believe in a future resurrection of the dead. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, post-tribbers often use this to cream the pre-tribbers, where it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. See, it says, let no man deceive you. And then in Matthew 24, 4, Jesus answered and said to them, take heed let that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And so just like pre-tribbers will take 2 Timothy 2.15, find an end times reference in there and say, therefore, if you're post-trib, you're not rightly dividing. Post-tribbers often take the let no man deceive you and then nail people for teaching imminency or pre-trib, even though Jesus and Paul are talking about not being deceived by the Antichrist. And pre-tribbers, post-tribbers know we should not accept any man as the Messiah. Matthew 24, 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall rise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, as so much, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert going out forth, behold, he's in the secret chamber, Believe it not. Listen, when Jesus comes back, you don't have to go looking for Jesus. He will come for you if you are saved. Pre-tribbers, post-tribbers, agree. Clearly in the Bible, the typical debate was not on timing or placement of the tribulation versus the resurrection, but on whether or not there was a resurrection. We have countless references to the Pharisees and Sadducees because you had the Sadducees who denied a resurrection that fight continued even in the church. In 1 Corinthians the resur 15, the resurrection chapter, Paul said, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And I will not fellowship with someone who denies a literal resurrection of the dead or a literal return of Christ. Pre-tribbers and post-tribbers are in agreement when it comes to that. Second Peter. Uh, 3.3, 3, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Pre-tribbers do not say that. Post-tribbers do not say that. We believe he is coming back. And on September 27th, 2014, that was the day I admitted to myself that I was no longer pre-trib. And you know what? I was a saved and a decent person who loved the Lord long before September 27th of 2014. And if someone wants to break fellowship with me over this issue, I believe they have every right to because I believe a, I believe in Christian liberty. No one has to fellowship with me. I can also understand someone who maybe is dealing with division in their church over this issue, maybe wanting to keep distance. But if somebody wants to claim they don't want to fellowship with me because they believe this means I'm not saved, or heretic, or dangerous, or whatever, that person's ignorant of scripture, or they're ignorant about what people like myself actually teach. And I do think this is something we ought to be able to have a civil conversation about it and have a healthy disagreement. But in the IFB world, that's not the case. And so what I want to show tonight is how most people's eschatology, and I would be put a lot of post-tribbers in this camp too, it's not based on actual Bible but on speculation based on years of brainwashing from guys like Clarence Larkin. Everyone claims they got their position from the Bible. But let me just tell you, I, I don't believe you. And none of us are where we are today just from the Bible. We have all been influenced by the books and the charts and people who wrote things about the Bible. And just because we've been influenced by these things doesn't mean we're necessarily wrong on what we believe, but most people have never taken the time to actually study out and determine what parts of their position are based on clear Bible teaching 
and what is based on speculation based on opinions about tough passages. And so I intend to be very dogmatic tonight where the Bible is dogmatic. And it's my goal to be 100% honest and let everyone know when I'm just giving my opinion. Now, I don't know what kind of discussion Nick's plan on having tonight, but I'm here to have a Bible discussion with Bible language. I'm here to talk about what the Bible says. I'm not here to defend anyone's charts. There are no charts in our Bible. And I am not here to be an obstinate, just to be obstinate or a jerk. But it's time we force people into using Bible language and Bible definitions. And if we do that, it will force us to admit what is opinion versus what is clear Bible teaching. And I do believe that the pre-trib position is really poorly thought out, is a poorly thought out theory based on many errors. And I also believe that many hold on to this because of fear of the pre-trib mafia, the brethren. And that's why you can have this vast uh, range of ways people all teach it, but they all claim that title pre-trib because you are not allowed to say anything other than that. And so if Nick's here to defend the pre-trib, let me just give you a few things I expect to hear tonight to prove my point that he's been influenced by charts, books about the Bible rather than the Bible. Because for one, I think he's going to want to talk about a seven-year tribulation. I think he's going to say things uh, like Daniel's 70th week, which I'm t right. That's where that comes from. There it is right there. Every chart, Daniel's 70th week. That's uh, what in the world? Uh, he, he's going to tell us the rapture and the second coming are two different events. Uh, he will refer to the seven-year tribulation as God's wrath. I'll probably talk about multiple raptures. You already mentioned that. Uh, he'll try to convince you Revelation 4 is a rapture. Talk about that. This is just in my notes. I'm reading it. I didn't know I was, if I was going to go first or second. And I'm sure there will probably be a whole lot of talk about the Jews and Israel, unfortunately. So when you force people to use Bible terminology and Bible definitions, it's very revealing. And you will see the pre-trib doctrine. It does not hold up to any real scrutiny. And so what I want to do tonight, you know, as we talk about these things, because uh, I said I've been fighting this stuff for nine years now, I always want to have a Bible discussion. But unfortunately, that is not what typically happens. We do not use Bible language. We do not use Bible definitions. Unfortunately, this is what I'm debating all the time. Larkin. And it's obvious by the language. I want to talk about the Bible tonight. And so does Nick's position come from this? Or does it come from this? It's real easy to tell. It's, it's real easy. And if we force ourselves into using this, it's going to change. It's going to change everything. And when we actually stop and take a look at what is spelled out and what is opinion and theory, it is, it's very revealing and it will, it will humble you in many ways and cause you to, uh, I think be more gracious. And I'm not saying Nick's not gracious on this subject. I don't know. Uh, I'm talking to my fellow independent fundamental preacher of Baptists. Uh, they're not very gracious when it comes to this subject. And I hope they watch us tonight and I hope they will be challenged about their language that they use and what's actually based on the text of the scriptures and what's been influenced by guys like this. And some of the, I, I never even read Clarence Larkin. You read a book by a guy who read Clarence Larkin. So, um, is, and then with the few minutes I have left, uh, you know, I just want to say too, when you're pre-trib, you can get away with just about anything, uh, in the pre-trib camp. You can say stuff like Steven saw the rapture and you won't get called out by too many pre-trib guys, as long as you're defending pre-trib, you know, uh, what, why, why are we saying things like metatafta and bringing that up that Greek, um, is that sleight of hand? These things are uh, distractions and, um, you know, that's th these things are not necessary. You know, everybody wants to talk about apostasia. Everyone's talking about metatafta. Everyone's talking about these things. These are these are sleight of hand. Do we and the reason I thought Nick was probably going to be solid. The only video I had seen of his, and I didn't even watch it, but it was one where he was defending the King James Bible. So I assumed uh, he was an IFB guy. But um Again, I, I hope, uh, you know, we stay. Uh, I wasn't going to bring up because the I, I watched like an hour 
of the video he did responding to my thing. And I heard him saying that he wasn't once saved, always saved. Now, that was really disappointing because I do have a lot of respect and a lot of love for my pre-trib brethren. And um, I wish we could have uh, got somebody a little more uh, fundamental to talk about this and not somebody who's going to go off and do a lot of weird stuff that I've never even heard before. Uh, so, um, you know, anyway, and, you know, then the last question I guess I kind of have too, you know, we talked about is conflating uh, the great tribulation. Where do you get the title, the great tribulation? I remember Jesus talking about there being great tribulation, but where, where, where did he give it the title, the great tribulation? I know where you can find that as a title. It's in Larkin's charts. Jesus said there'll be great tribulation. That's not a title. That's a thing. So that's all I have. All right, Pastor Tommy McMurtry, thank you for the 15-minute opening statement. As we move into rebuttals, I will give one reminder and disclaimer for tonight. Let's stay on topic. The topic tonight is the rapture. Is the pre-tribulation rapture biblical? Let's not bring up other topics that might result in rabbit trails, as I really want to utilize our uh, couple hours that we'll be spending here together. And uh, the topic of eschatology is more than, than uh, comprehensive for that. So, Nick, let's hand it over to you. You do have an eight-minute rebuttal. And so whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Cheers. Thanks, Donnie. Um, I didn't know that um, I wasn't supposed to talk about a certain topic, so I won't bring that up again. And so, but I don't think anything that I'm going to say will really um, go outside of that. So you can just pretend I am of that position. So, um, yeah, the I'll, I'll just go through some of the things uh, that Tommy has said. Um, that you know, I could be worse than a ruckman on it because um, you know I believe you know Stephen. Um, didn't immediately go to heaven. Well, I think he immediately went to the rapture and went straight to heaven. So he did immediately go to heaven. But that rapture hasn't happened yet. And so I don't believe in soul sleep. I don't believe that people, you know, 2,000 years ago go to heaven they're just waiting around for 2,000 years and then, you know, we show up in the rapture. They, the Bible clearly says the dead in Christ shall rise first and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Um, we're caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the end. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So we don't go before them. We don't, there's no one precedes one another. We go up together with them. And so for Stephen, it's an immediate thing that he gets, oh, if the rapture happened right now, I would go up and I'd turn around and there's this guy here. And so like, who are you? And I'm, well, I'm Stephen. I just got stoned to death. And I'm like, well, I'm Nick. I know about you from the book of Acts. And, and then we see Jesus. Yeah. It's so it, doesn't make me you know, worse than a Ruckmanite. It is quite a biblical thing if you um, think outside of the box a little bit and outside of the IFB box and outside of the Ruckmanite box, you can uh, see that clearly just from looking at the text. Um, so 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it's very clear that it says um, that the fall, a falling away happens first. So this falling away, now we understand most of the time, a falling is something negative. If someone rang you up and said, I just had a fall, it would be a bad thing. But um, falling, we fall. I, I fell down before the face of Jesus this morning. We, The Bible says the 24 elders fall down and put their thrones before um, before Christ, um, yeah, pre-trib in, um, in the book of Revelation chapter 5. And um, we fall. You know, so the whole concept of falling, the falling away... When um, I know Tommy seems to say we can't go to Greek, okay. So um, one of the things is I run a website called Texas Receptus, and so we're, I'm doing Bible translation work into Urdu. Um, we've done a translation into the Khmer language of Cambodia. What? And so I can't go to the Greek when I'm talking about doctrine. Uh, you know, Metatafta. Why bring that up? Well, it just when people see that, that there's two different. Uh, English words, but they're the same Greek word. I, I don't know where he gets this concept from. It's sort of like a Gail Ripplinger type of thing um, where you can't go to the Greek. I mean, uh, Greek's just another language. I know there's certain passes in the new IFB who do go to the Greek just to explain things, you know. And so when you go to the word apostasia, now the term apostasia, most people think of the English word apostasy, 
because we have an English word called apostasy, they think, oh, it's a great falling away from the faith. Now, I've never encountered a verse that has so much baggage. Usually it's called the falling away. It's not. It's a falling away. Usually it's the great falling away. It doesn't say great. And usually they say um, the great falling away and the man of sin be revealed. And then it says, and those two things have to happen first. But it doesn't. It says a falling away happened first. So the falling away, it comes from um, apostasia, apo meaning from, and stasia meaning to stand. So you're taken away from a standing position. You've fallen away. It's perfectly clear in the in the King James. So if we look up in history, um, physicians, they would use the word apostasia um, when they were detaching the placenta from the uterus. It's a detachment. Even if we were just go to the Geneva Bible. I mean, I go through all the Reformation Bibles to defend the King James all the time. If we go to the Geneva Bible, it just has the word departing here. Now, it doesn't say departing from the faith. That's another sort of bit of baggage that's put on there. It doesn't say it's a departing from the faith. And actually, if we were to look at it very carefully, there is a movie about the Jewish people called uh, Marching to Zion. Now, the, um, the person who made that movie, I would be convinced that he's telling people to leave Zionism. OK, but, uh, we would all agree with that. This is exactly what Paul was accused of doing when in Acts chapter 22, verse 21, it says, and they are informed of you that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake, that's apostasia, Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the custom. So I would say this movie is saying that as well. Uh, they were saying to Paul um, the, that... Uh, you're telling people to forsake Moses. The word forsake here is exactly the same Greek word. It only appears twice in, in the New Testament. And so if we read through 2 Thessalonians, it's very clear that this is talking about a rapture happening first. Now, this is quite amazing. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The Geneva Bible has a departure first, um, like detaching the placenta. That was that was written in the 1600s, by the way, the Greek definition of detaching the placenta from the... There's a detachment. There is... It's interesting. My wife is from Pakistan. She speaks Urdu. I said, what does your Bible say? She said, it says the same word as the book of Exodus. That's what it says in the, her Bible. And so, and it's an accurate translation. It's, it's, there's no change. In the, it's just what it says. It's a departing. It's a falling away. But people read into it that it's a falling away from the faith. They add those words. They add the words, the great falling away to it as well. And so it's just become this doctrine they're squeezing into there. And I used to think that. I used to believe that until recently. I've just done a, finished a two-month study on this, and um, I cannot unsee this now. Um, I was wrong. It's not a falling away from the faith. It is a departure. It's um, it's a forsaking of this world. We're going to be kidnapped. The Bible says the harpazo, it's like being harpooned. Um, the, the word rapture is related to, you know, kidnapping. If you do an etymology uh, search on the word rapture, that's what it means. And so um, this verse clearly says a falling away first, a rapture will happen first and then that man of sin will be revealed. So it's very clear. Fixing with pre-trib, actually, this actually just totally writes off the whole post-trib thing. We may as well just bury it. Um, it's it's just gone. And to me, I, I can't unsee that. And One I would minute. anyone in the world, I will debate them on that particular topic. And so uh, influenced by charts, I mean, you know, who are, who are the new IFB influenced by? Tex Mars? I mean, you know, these are bad symbols and stuff. You know, people go and see a football game and go like that, and all of a sudden they're making demonic symbols. Tex Mars is very, very kooky, weird and strange. And so it's like I could I could do a genealogical fallacy on the IFB of where they got their stuff from. I usually assume that people think for themselves. And they don't just have a, a chart and go, oh, that's it. You know, I've questioned many things over the years. I've changed my position many times over the years, and I'd prefer to be rebuked by the Bible rather than a genealogical fallacy. Nick Sayers, thank you very much for that eight-minute 
uninterrupted rebuttal. Now we're going to hand it over to uh, Pastor Tommy McMurtry. Tommy, whenever you're ready, you have eight minutes. The floor is yours. All right. Hey, Nick, if I start quoting Tex Mars, if I start using Tex Mars language or whoever, let me know. I intend to use Bible language tonight. And when I said you can't go back to, I didn't say you can't go back to the Greek. Let's not play the sleight of hand trick of going back to the Greek where you spend a lot of time talking about apostasia and all these things that could mean instead of just focusing on the text. And it's very to teach that a rapture has to happen before the man of sin is revealed is absolutely ridiculous. If you read the passage where it says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus, which is what I believe we should call it, the coming of the Lord. I am looking forward to the coming of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am looking forward to our gathering together unto him. I wonder why we don't want to call it our gathering together unto him, because we might associate what we see in Matthew 24, where he shall send his angels to gather elect from the four winds. We might think that's the rapture. And he said, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day what? The day of Christ, the day of our gathering, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, except there come a falling away first. So are you telling me that the falling away is the coming of the Lord? The falling away is the gathering together? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So let no man deceive any means that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. This has to happen before the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. Uh, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And just like Jesus talked about Matthew 24, there are going to be false Christ that they're going to come and they are going to deceive if we're possible, the very elect there. He's going to come first who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he is God instead of the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So what I want to talk about, though, there's a lot we could say about this is how you read that falling away. And then you do a sleight of hand where you start talking about apostasy and all the things it could possibly mean. Well, wait a minute. Why don't we read this passage, the falling away, and ask ourselves, what could that be? What is, what is Paul talking about? What would the uh, right, or what would the Thessalonians have thought when he talked about a falling away when he read that right here? And understand when we are reading this passage right here that there are some things that we can't know for sure because notice what he said in verse five after he says all these things he says remember ye not that when i was yet with you i told you these things so there's some things that he talked about we don't know for sure what those things are so when it comes to this falling away well we can definitely assume from the scriptures that a falling away is going to happen before the coming of our lord what that is exactly it's mostly speculation. I've got theories. I think the falling away, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, um, would be people uh, accepting someone who is not Jesus as the Antichrist or as the Messiah, seeing that's exactly what Paul told them not to be deceived by. Seeing that is the exact same thing Jesus said when he said, let no man deceive you. He talked about false Christ. I believe that when the uh, when the antichrist or the the man of sin is revealed i believe many people are going to be deceived by him i believe many professing christians will be deceived by him obviously saved people won't but i believe many will and so a lot of people they look at all the apostasy going on in the world today that's the falling away right there that paul is talking about okay so the falling away that paul is talking about second thessalonians 2 was something prophesied for 2000 years later, uh, going on right now in 2023, or was it more specific than that? You know, back in the day, a lot of people used to think it was the, uh, starting of the Catholic church the and the rise of the Pope. A lot of people thought that was the falling away and the man of sin being revealed. I mean, the Pope for sure is an antichrist figure. That was a very, uh, big thing when the Catholic church started and, um, it has deceived a lot of people. But historically, a lot of people believe that that's what it was. But it's opinion. It's speculation. The problem is we speculate on these things and we say so much about it that it just becomes sound doctrine to a lot of people. And then people foolishly try defending it to the bitter end. 
And while it's my opinion that the falling away is uh, people accepting a man as the Messiah who is not Jesus, um, you know, I'm not going to fight that to the bitter end. Paul talked to these guys about some things that I wasn't there in the room for. And so I think they would have known exactly what he was talking about. Um, there's a lot of things that Paul would write about that we're not going to know for sure what he's talking about when he's greeting certain, telling them to greet certain people and referring to personal things. We don't know what all that involves. These are actual letters to actual people. And so what we're having people do is they're taking a passage like that and then they're telling you what it means, not based on the text, not based on something else in the scriptures that could fit. No, but based on a Greek definition uh, that doesn't work, that doesn't make sense. Hey, you can say it's a good theory. You could say it's possible, but let's not get dogmatic about that. Tommy, thank you very much for that rebuttal. Gentlemen, that concludes the opening statements and the rebuttals for tonight's debate. Let me restart the timer. We're now moving into a roughly 45-minute open discussion where we can ask each other questions and discuss the topic. Again, the topic being the pre-tribulation rapture. Is it biblical? As the discussion's going on to the audience, uh, feel free to send in all of your eschatology related questions. We'll make sure to have, as usual, an excellent audience Q&A where uh, our guests tonight can, can debate or engage your questions. So with that, uh, Pastor McMurtry just ended with his rebuttal. And therefore, Nick, why don't we allow you to pick the first topic for discussion? Gentlemen, the floor is yours. So I just sort of bring up, um... I listened to Tommy. Sorry, that's fading out a little bit. Um, I listened to Tommy the other day and he said to go to this chart. Sorry, it's like a disco in here. Someone might have an epileptic fit looking at that. But it says Daniel's 70th week and it clearly says the Great Tribulation down the bottom on this chart that Tommy was pointing to in the sermon that I was um, going through. So I'm not sure why I'm the Clarence Larkinite. And um, when other people feel free to use terms like the 70th week of Daniel and the abomination of desolation and oh yeah that's biblical but the, the great tribulation is written there it says great tribulation so I would just say um uh the great tribulation is just a title that we've been handled it's like the textus receptus people make a big fuss about all that it's just a title we weren't we were handed that I wasn't born when the Texas receptus was labeled I've just being given that, and, and now I have to work out where, where it fits. So the, the title, The Great Tribulation, is just a handy thing that describes the period of seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, and um, that that is called The Great Tribulation. So um, I'm sure that Tommy would would agree with that. Would you agree with that, um, that, Tommy, that we can both use these type of terms, the 70th week of Daniel and The Great Tribulation? I think it's very confusing. I think if, you, if you're going to use a term that's a Bible word, you need to use it the way the Bible did. And okay. I don't believe that does that. And yes, I used to recommend certain charts, but I also used to be pre-trib. And um, I, 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 do not, I, I do not recommend any chart that says Daniel's 70th week, uh, the tribulation, the great tribulation. I think it's very misleading and it, um, it's a great cause for confusion. But I have okay. said in the past, but I, I don't yeah. anymore. I guess it's hard for me. Old habits die hard, you know, to, it's to hard. just strictly use biblical terms and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a discipline so, you have to learn, and I'm I'm still working on it. Yeah. Uh, so can you show me where in the Bible does it say that we should get Revelation chapter 6 to 12? And sort of fold them back over Revelation chapter 13 and 19. Where, well, um, why should we do that? Where does it say in the Bible to do that? It doesn't. Okay. It's um, theory. So, yeah. Okay. So, so you're admitting that that um, is not. Yeah, it's, um, it's a theory based on an assumption that we are right about uh, how we lay, how we time things. Can't prove it. Okay, so would you agree that when we're talking to text critics and they get the two appearances, one time Jesus, he 
cast the demons out of one person and the next time he went to a different location and cast the demons out of two two demon possessed guys would you agree that it's sloppy scholarship when they conflate those two things together well i think um what's happening in that situation is that in that event um i think both happened where uh there were two people but and one talked about the two where one only focused on one individual okay so you actually believe what the text critics do that it's it's just the one event yes okay that's not usually the king james position um i would encourage you to read will kinney's i've not look, i've not done a deep dive on that yeah but no that's my cool. opinion on that uh, so i thought you might have been up to date on that so um no. but yeah and that's fine you know i didn't understand that till like you know 10 years ago or whatever but um i was just sort of saying that um the the conflating of say revelation chapter 6 with revelation 13 and um all revelation 14 with revelation 7 and to me that's very similar sort of just getting bible stories and say oh that's the same they've got similar features and just placing them on top of each other and so i would say that's not really yeah I, I think it's a i think it's a good theory because what we're seeing in the book of revelation is we're looking for chrono you know we're wanting to find the chronological events as how they're going to play out in our timeline but you got to understand too that john is writing the things he saw and so i believe john is writing the things in revelation in the order that he saw them but john can only see one thing at a time and so um i i think sometimes what you're seeing is him um you're seeing a view of things kind of from earth and then another you're kind of seeing a view from heaven and and where we place all those things it can be uh very difficult and it is something that people get overly dogmatic about okay um so just uh, in revelation chapter six um in in the seals there it talks about um the people under the altar mm -hmm. and um I'll just find that it says Revelation 6, 9. And when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, etc." you know, but then they were told that they should rest a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren, that they should be killed. Okay. So then when you get to Revelation chapter seven, it's talking about these same guys, you know, um, John saw them and that they have white robes and all that. And so it says that they've all been killed. Where are the living who have been raptured here? Are there any, is there anyone living? Because Revelation 6 says they're all going to be killed. How do you know the ones in 7 were all killed? Um, because Revelation chapter 6, there's already a bunch of dead ones. And then it says that your brethren should be killed as you were. So they're all going to be killed too. And then... Um, uh, so that they've got to wait until that happens mm -hmm. right so, but well according to the way i would lay things out in revelation um he's not a, you know they're asking when you're going to avenge us uh which seems to imply god is not pouring his wrath out yet you know if the pre-tribbers are right and the seals are god's wrath um when they said how long you know god should have said what do you think i've been doing for the last four seals but no, they're like, when are you going to avenge? Because he hasn't done it yet. And he's saying there's still a little season to come that because uh, more are going to die. And so I believe in Revelation 7, that's when uh, we see that happening. Now, and here's something that you need to realize too. You know, you brought, you kept bringing up the caught up, you know, caught up. And, but here's why they're caught up. Okay? It's because of the resurrection. Everybody wants to talk about the rapture, the rapture, the rapture. Mm -hmm. Why don't we call it the resurrection? Because you yeah. do realize a vast majority, a massive percentage, and I don't even want to guess the percentage of people who get taken up are going to be dead. It's only going to be a small mm -hmm. remnant left that actually gets that, that, that are alive and remain. And so in Revelation 7, I would say, yeah, most of those people were dead. But there, I do believe that uh, those who are alive and remain were caught up with them. So um, I think what we're just seeing there in Revelation 6 is that tribulation's not over yet. Uh, God's people are still being uh, hunted down by the Antichrist. And, and so 
God's not ready to pour his wrath out yet. He's got to pull us out first. And I believe we see that happen in chapter seven. And I, I would actually concede with um, you and Donnie that I think the wrath actually does start around that period of time. And so I think the whole concept of having, um, I, I think the IFB guys and the Ruckmanites are actually both wrong on the concept of the, you know, God has not appointed us to wrath mm -hmm. as being like a period of time. Right. To me, God can pour out his wrath in the, in the plagues of Egypt. Egypt was getting wrath. Um, Goshen was not at the same time. The, the the Passover lamb it just went from house to house. Oh, you got the blood. Oh, you don't. You get the wrath. And so, to I think what we've actually done is we've created timelines around that scripture. And so, I would just I would probably agree with you. Just going through your stuff and Donnie's stuff, that um, the wrath of God is not really poured out until um, that the last seal sort of thing. Um, so I know that that doesn't fit in with the Ruckmanite plan, but it still fits in with my plan. I'm just like, oh, that's just the timeline, you know. And so um, I, I think it's a very scholarly thing that you guys have figured out that out. But to me, it just I don't because I'm not in the Ruckmanite camp. That doesn't really affect my pre-tribness. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And in Revelation 14, you know, it's it's very clear. In verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. And we all believe that this is the method that the beast uses to go after God's people is the mark of the beast. And it says, Any that take it, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. So, it's very clear right there in Revelation 14, God hasn't poured his wrath out yet. You know, in Revelation 6, God hasn't poured out his wrath yet because even though tribulation is going on, even though trouble's going on, the souls that have been martyred, uh, the souls, not the body, the souls that are under the altar, they're crying out how long. And in Revelation 7, um, you know, we see what appears to be uh, more of a resurrection too because one of the things that it notices uh, about these people is one, they're arrayed in white robes and there he's looking at them and notices that they're from every kindred in, in tongue. You know, how do you know by looking at it? Well, you know, cause you can, uh, it's, it's going to be racially diverse and because the bodies are there. So, um, I think that's more evidence that a resurrect, a physical resurrection took place. So again, if we stay on, if we called, if we called the rapture, the resurrection, it would get rid of a lot of confusion, but it would also cause a lot of problems if you're pre-trib. Um, I, I actually sort of call, I usually say the rapture slash resurrection. Um, I think in the book of Revelation, it does talk about um, three res, uh, three raptures of alive people. So it talks about um, pre-trib, like I explained, you know, and John is symbolic of that. Um, and then the, the second one is the tribulation saints. I believe they're all dead. Um, in Revelation um, uh, chapter 7. Then the two witnesses are alive. They're obviously alive. They're caught up. That It said, come up hither. And they were caught up. Then 144,000 are all of a sudden before the throne. I know if um, I was listening to your Revelation series, and, and um, but if you have the seven-year period as being a, a chronological sequence from chapter 6 all the way through to chapter 19, um, and the 144,000 mentioned in 7, it's a culmination of what's happened to them in Revelation chapter 14, then they're before the throne. So obviously they've been raptured or resurrected. And so I, I well, resurrected would be the proper term because I believe that they all died. Then in the same chapter, we have a harvest. So they were all dead. Then we have the people who overcome the mark of the beast. They were all dead. But then at the second coming, there is a another gathering. And this involves people people in heaven, it clearly says um, from people from one end of heaven to the other. So that would be all the people who have been resurrected up into um, into heaven from that uh, from the earlier points. And it also says, and from one um, end of earth um, to the other. So it talks about that in Mark uh, chapter 13. And so, uh, and these are the all the elect of God. They're all taken to that place um, in in Revelation chapter 19, or I would believe that um, Revelation, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 24, that that is that second coming. That is that gathering. 
And that is another type of rapture. Okay, so if Matthew 24 is the second coming, why is 1 Thessalonians 4 not the second coming? Because it says, um, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. It, Paul called it the coming of the Lord. There's mm. multiple references to what everyone would agree is the rapture as the coming of the Lord. You know, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. Why is that not the second coming? Is that the second coming? So, And, and if that's the second coming and Matthew 24 is the second coming, why are they not the same event? Yeah. And so is it, um, is it because Larkin called it the second coming? The, um, and the rapture, he separated those events. See, that's we can't do that. I used to do it. You can't say the rapture and the second coming are two different events. You can't you can't say things like there's a difference between Christ coming for his saints and Christ coming with his saints, because it says in First Thessalonians 4, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So First Thessalonians 4, it's not even all about the uh the you know rapture it's about the resurrection he's talking about them that are asleep and he's telling the people that when jesus comes back he's bringing them with him and, and he's doing that at his coming so i don't know i don't know how you can biblically i i, I know all the charts separate the blessed hope and the glorious appearing and the rapture from the second coming i don't know how with the bible you can possibly do that the you know, the paul and the biblical languages language all uses the same language. They don't use the term rapture. They do say coming. Uh, but yet people will say, well, that's a rapture. That's not the second coming. Well, then which coming is that? So can, can, yeah. can you at least understand why I would uh, think the second coming is the rapture when you when yeah. Paul literally called it that? When yeah, in, guess, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, we have to assume in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him, that it's the same coming that he referred to in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he said and when he talked about the coming of our Lord. And the yeah, he said, We'll be caught up. I think caught up and gathered uh can be synonymous. So I, I don't know. I, I need you to show me how you can biblically separate those two events. Okay, so if we were to look at the Bible holistically, um, the first coming of Christ, we say that's a coming. Um, and so when we look at the book of Revelation, we see many times where Jesus, um, he, in the, in the rapture, he comes for the church. And then at the second coming, he's coming to the earth. So it's just the same word to describe different events. I don't think we can conflate all the events together because it's using the same word. It's a bit like um, if I was running, it doesn't mean that every time I use the word running in a sentence, it means I'm going to the same location. Mm. Uh, the coming, the second coming, Christ coming for the church, all this sort of stuff. The, these, uh, This type of terminology, uh, we've just got to put it in its correct uh, semantic range. Mm. Well, And conflating two things is very possible to do that. But what no one has ever, ever done is no one ever has... No one has ever been able to show me biblically how I am conflating those two things. People are insisting I call something the rapture and then I call Armageddon the second coming and things like that. But nobody can display from the scripture. That's how I do it. How, how, you know how you do that. Paul called it the coming. You know, over and over yeah. again, he called it. He called it the coming. People are literally saying you haven't said this yet, but, you know, and I'm sure you've heard it. You got to understand the difference between Christ coming for his saints and coming with his saints. Paul said he's coming with them in, in, in 1 Thessalonians and other places too, the coming of our Lord with all his saints, it says. So um, I when I hear people say that, I feel like I'm arguing with this. I'm not arguing with the Bible. And so when I, when I hear certain language, when I hear people avoiding the term of the resurrection over and over again, and I don't know if we'll have time to do some of this and maybe focus on some of these words. But um, when, if you just start reading the passages 
where it uses the term resurrection that you can't possibly separate those things. If we just, if, uh, if you start defining the resurrection by what the scripture says, when you look at tribulation, okay, because you, you want to know my position on the tribulation. I know we're mainly talking about pre-trib and some people are getting triggered that I'm not really defending my position. Uh, we're mainly talking about pre-trib, but I'll just go ahead and share some of my position on these things. I think it's interesting how um, the seals, there's no timeline. We don't see any timeline um, in the first half, I believe. Well, or no, not in the, at least through the seals. No timeline through the seals, none. But yet everybody insists there's this three and a half year period in there of tribulation. And if we are start tracing where they get that word from, well, the thing, you know, they mainly get it because of Matthew chapter 24. But then it's like, well, there's no timeline in Matthew 24 either. So where are we getting the seven years from? Well, Daniel's 70th week. But wait a minute. Daniel's 70th week is 100 percent spelled out clearly about Israel. It's about desolate, not even just Israel, desolations of Jerusalem. It's specifically about events in one city. It's specifically about events that Jesus said would take place in that generation. And like all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ, within those prophecies that had near fulfillments to come, there were also messianic uh, prophecies contained in there that alluded to something in the distant future. We see that over and over again with Old Testament prophecies where it would be prophesying about something that was going on in that day, like both the uh, uh, kingdoms losing uh, losing their king, but there was a prophecy contained there about the virgin birth. There was, some, there was a prophecy about that generation, but there was also a prophecy about the virgin birth that happened like 700 years later. In Matthew 24, 100%, it's clearly prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, there's not gonna be one stone left upon another happened in that generation. Yes, there is second coming uh, prophecies in there as well that have not been fulfilled. Uh, but at the same time, we don't, there's no timeline given. And he's talking to his disciples who were wondering, when are you gonna set up your kingdom? They're under this Roman oppression. And Jesus is basically letting them know, hey, listen, you guys got a lot more trouble coming then you realize if you want to know my belief about the tribulation, I believe uh, for lack of a better term, the tribulation is just the church age. We've always been in tribulation over and over again in the Bible. If you look up tribulation, you know, the passage of tribulation, I mean, Jesus said in the world, you shall have tribulation. He said that talking to the disciples, the apostle Paul, when talking to the Thessalonians who were being, who were in tribulation, he said in 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And ye know, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, for that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God through your patience and faith and all your persecution and tribulations which ye endure. Uh, yeah, and he, uh, he talked about how we were appointed to tribulations. So tribulation, what that is a reference to, the disciples didn't understand what was coming yet with Christ's kingdom. They thought they were going to have control of the kingdom. They thought they were going to have peace, all these things. But no, the, the church age, you could say God's kingdom, it has been in tribulation for 2,000 years. Now, does that mean I believe that the seals are covering 2,000 years of church history? I think it's a good theory. Um, do I think it's three and a half years? I think it's a good theory. But you can't dogmatically say that. Here's what we can dogmatically say. Jesus promised we would have tribulation. Over, when you look at all, 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 pretty much every reference to tribulation, it's us going through it. We're never going to be popular on this world. Now, does that mean I don't believe in this future escalated um, period of time of great tribulation? Well, I'm not going to call it great tribulation because the great tribulation in Matthew 24 you know, I think it um, it was a reference to what took place in 70 AD. Now, is great tribulation coming? Sure. Uh, and I've got a bunch of theories uh, when it comes to that stuff, but I'm not going to get dogmatic about those things. Um, I, 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 But here's what I do believe is still to come. The mark of the beast. Um, I've not heard a good theory that that ever happened historically. Uh, the rise of the Antichrist, you know, him... Uh, making war with the saints, 
and, and overcoming. I, I still believe that that is something that's in the future, but I don't want to call it the great tribulation because then people will assume I'm talking about Matthew 24 and certain events that were exclusively about a period of time prophesied about Jerusalem. There is nothing in Daniel 9 about global events. There's nothing in Matthew 24 about global events. It's 100% about Jerusalem. And so we need to uh, understand that. Now, the seals, there is a, a parallel you can make between certain things that came on Jerusalem and the seals. Uh, what's going on there? Well, here's a theory. Just like God judged Jerusalem for what they had done with what had been given to them. God had worked in Jerusalem for 2,000 years uh, from the time of Abraham to the time of Christ, roughly. And they did nothing with what they had been given. There was no fruit on that fig tree. The kingdom was taken from them, went to the Gentiles. And so just like God judged Jerusalem for what they had done with the gospel, I believe judgment is going to come on this entire world uh, for what they have done with the gospel. And just like Jerusalem went through great tribulation, however, um, Jesus did not come back during that time and save them because they didn't call on him. They didn't believe on him. I, I do believe when God allows the tribulation to come on the world or the seals, sorry about that. You got to get disciplined in this area. When the seals start getting broken and they come on the world, I believe we will see a similar, similar pattern globally, like we saw in Matthew 24 on Jerusalem. And, but this time, um, there will be, um, people saved. There will be people caught up because there will be people of faith because uh, that early church, those who did believe on Christ, they successfully evangelized the world. And we're proof of that. We are still here today. We are fruit from that ministry. And I, and so the next time um, Jesus is going to find all the things that he didn't find in his day of visitation on, on that Palm Sunday, 2000 years ago, when he rode into Jerusalem, there was nothing there. He he drove those people out. And, but when he comes back the second time, we're going to be ready. Not because we're so much better than the Jews, but because of what Jesus Christ has done through us, because of his, his shed blood, uh, all we have is faith. So, Okay. And so I, I, would, um, I would disagree with the tribulation. Uh, concept there. I believe that there was a type of tribulation that happened to the Jews in 70 AD, but I, I think there will be a greater um, time that Jesus spoke about that was not since the beginning of the world uh, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. I think that is, um, and I, I don't think it's like the knives are going to be blunter and they're going to pull your nails out quicker or anything like that. It's just the amount of people who are being um, persecuted. That's all, the only reason it's called a great tribulation so it's it's like um there was this tribulation happening all around the world at the moment in pakistan in china everywhere but this is going to be the great or a great tribulation uh, the biggest one and so to me that's that's how i would read um that and what jesus is talking about in matthew 24 and so but it's it's interesting that yeah. it one of the things that um, I've noticed that people talk about is after the tribulation. And so um, it says that the moon will be darkened. Now, can you, uh, would you concede that it doesn't actually say the moon is going to turn to blood? In Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew 24, it doesn't say the moon is going to turn to blood, but it actually says it's going to be darkened. Would you concede that? Yeah, it says that, but would you concede that a red moon is darker than a white one? Um, I guess, like like with John McCarthy, you know, he he sort of conflates the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus together. They're very similar, but they're very distinct. And so, so do you believe you don't believe Matthew twenty four and um, Revelation six are the same event? No, I think um, I think the whole period of the seven years in the book of revelation is a whole time of tribulation where pockets of tribulation happen all the way through it and so unless you do the folding thing you know then it sort of like fits into one 
But in Matthew 24, he is talking about the latter part because the abomination desolation happens three and a half years into that seven years period. Um, or, you know, I could say biblically time times and half a time, but I don't want to be, you know, I'd have to check everything that I'm saying. So I probably will use Larkin language, I guess. But um, there, there are things that happen. People, um, you know, the 144,000, there's a whole bunch of um, people who get uh, taken up who have overcome the beast um, and they sing the song of the lamb and all that sort of stuff. So these guys are taken up. And, but the thing is, Matthew 24 is clearly not saying that the moon will turn to blood. It says the sun will be darkened. If you look at Revelation chapter 8, it says a th a, the sun is darkened, uh, a third of the sun is darkened, a third of the moon is darkened. Um, sorry, I keep conflating. I keep saying the sun and the moon and getting them confused, mm. but hopefully you're following me. Um, and I think by the time we get to the end with Babylon burning and all sorts of, you know, forest fires and all sorts of troubles, I think there is darkness through that's on and off throughout that whole period. But the specific one about the blood moon is that's Joel and it's also in Acts and it's that happens in Revelation chapter 6. It's specifically the blood moon. Now, um, I, I think that that is, that is fulfilled in that. Then if you look at the um, Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, it's talking about the sun darkened. So to me, that's that's the type of thing that's happening after um, the moon is um, is darkened. That's the type of thing that comes after, and so it also talks about stars and things like that. And so when I've just been doing a study through that, and I just realised, hang on, it doesn't actually mention like because when, when I'm going through you know popular movies that have been made by you know um, um, one of your friends. Uh, he sort of just runs through Matthew 24 and says, see, the blood's turned, uh, the moon's turned to blood. And I'm like, it doesn't say that. It says the moon's turned to darkness. So, But he's using that specific one to make that the first three and a half years, where if you read Matthew 24 from about um, verse 15 and put it into the three and a half year period, which the, the moon is just darkened, it makes a lot of sense. And so um, hopefully you're following me with that. Yeah, no, well... You know, that's one of those things where you got to kind of go back and look and it's like, okay, are we 100% sure this is actually what this is saying? Because obviously, um, you know, in the uh, typical post-trib chart uh, that people would come up with, uh, you know, they've got the seals and the sixth seal being the sun darkened and the moon turned to blood. And in Matthew chapter 24, you do have um, wars, famines, you know, you said, or you said false Christ mentioned, kind of like first seal wars famines pestilence um all the same order that you see with the seals and then you have people being persecuted you have martyrs kind of like the fifth seal and then you got the sun darkened and so the thing is too if if you want to ins insist that that is a different event that's not the moon turning into blood maybe that's something that happened uh you know back when israel got theirs seeing that that's what matthew 24 is uh mainly about um, so, but at the same time too, um, a moon turning red, you know, blood moons are darker than your typical white full moon. So it, that, you know, the, the fact that it uses a different word doesn't prove it's a different event, but is it, is it possible? Maybe it's one of those areas where we are, um, interpreting something based on an assumption that we're right about other things and sometimes you get some of those things wrong and it'll make your assumptions on other things wrong but e either way the uh sun dark and the moon turn to blood that's a pretty big event um you know which i think what it's mainly what we ought to get from it is in joel it talks about the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon of blood before that great notable day of the lord comes so mm. i believe that the sixth seal happens before the day of the Lord. And it's my position that the day of the Lord and the day of Christ uh, are this do happen at the same time. I believe the day of the Lord references is a reference to judgment, God judging the world. But the day of Christ or the day of the Messiah um, is a reference to those who are saved and those who are looking for him. Those days, while it will be the same day, they will be very different for the saved versus the lost. And so 
I do believe that event takes place before the coming of Christ. And so the thing is too, when an, another reason I would have a really, really almost impossible time getting away from uh, Matthew 24, when it talks about the sun and the moon being dark and that not being uh, the same event is first off immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay. We're in the tribulation it's church age. You could say not saying that the antichrist is, or the man of sin has been revealed. I don't believe that's happened yet, but we're definitely in tribulation that that's biblical. You can, that's spelled out in the Bible. Um, so when that time is done, uh, I do believe the sun will be darkened. Moon will turn to blood. And then what's going to happen? Jesus is coming right after that. Just like we in, in Revelation 6. What did they say? Hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is coming. Who should be able to stand? Revelation 7, we see this multitude, no man can number, from all over the world appear before the throne. So again, it does. It, it, it fits. It, it fits, assuming we've got a lot of our, our pieces in the right places uh, but how much of that spelled out i i think I, i'm afraid when it comes to this particular detail uh i don't know that we're necessarily going to get anywhere too conclusive with it um so would you see that um uh in the book of Revelation, where it talks about the the angel to the church of Revelation, uh, sorry, to the angel of the church of Ephesus and the angel of the church of mm -hmm. Smyrna, that these these could be humans and not actually heavenly angels. Yeah, I think it's possible. Okay, and so in Revelation nineteen ten and twenty two nine, John went to worship um, an angel, and one of the angels said, "I am of thy brethren, and have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God." Mm -hmm. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then later he says, I'm of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So would you think that this could possibly be like a, a human, like a resurrected human? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So would you also think that in uh, Revelation chapter 5, when it talks about the innumerable amount of angels um, who are around the throne... And it says there's uh, 10,000 times 10,000. And we've just gone through where it says um, they've, um, they're singing a song, they're kings and priests and they'll reign on the earth and from every tribe and language or every kindred tongue, people and nation. Would you concede that they, those angels could possibly be raptured saints? And that's in Revelation chapter 5. Verse. Well, the thing is, in these other places where it very much looks like it could be a human, especially when one says, I'm the fellow servant, what do we see him doing? We see him giving a message, you know, and and we're assuming a possibility that the seven churches are um, pastors or whatever that are messengers in the church because we know there are messengers in the church. That that other group, we don't see any kind of message being given. So um, just because these other ones could be humans doesn't mean for sure that these other people that we're seeing are angels. Okay, and so um, who would you say in Revelation chapter 5, if we read, say, from verse 9, um, they say they're from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and it says, um, you've made us unto our God, kings and priests. So it talks about kings and priests, which is mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, and we shall reign on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the innumerable amount of angels and all that are there. Uh, so who would you say here is the people who have been redeemed from every every kindred tongue, people, and nation? Um, because you've got the 24 elders, you've got the four beasts, and the angels. So they're the only three groups mm -hmm. of people mentioned here. Um, who would you say are the kings and priests? Who would you say are the us? We mm -hmm. shall reign on the earth. And um, who, where would, who would you say is that? Well, I believe when people die, they go straight to heaven. So I think it's the mm -hmm. soul's um you know of the saints is that the 24 elders you think they're the souls no of the i don't th i think the 24 elders are just 24 elders probably so you think the angels are the souls of the saints no i think uh, there's the angels beast. too i think you i think, think there's 24 elders i think there's angels i think they're souls of saints i think they're seraphims 
Uh, it doesn't mention any anyone else but those three categories: the twenty-four elders, the the beasts, well, and the. Well, it does mention them because it specifically mentions a group of, uh, you know, ten thousand times and thousands and all that stuff. Yeah, and that's the voice of many angels around the throne. So uh, oh, to right. me, that's clearly pre-trip. I mean, I can't get around that. That someone is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. There. Well, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All the yeah. saints in heaven are redeemed. And so, but it doesn't mention anyone else being there, but these three classes. And so clearly to me, these angels are, are fit the bill. Um, I guess in your, I'm sort of giving you the answer, I guess, for your position, you can say, well, these angels are resurrected people all throughout time who have died. Like Stephen well, not, I wouldn't heaven. say they're resurrected people. Okay. I would or say they're the souls that are in heaven. Okay. So, you, but you would probably have to concede that these angels are the people then. If it possibly, I mean, there could, there, you know, or it could just be an innumerable company of angels. I don't know how many angels are in heaven. Okay. But someone's been redeemed from the, by the blood of the lamb out of every tribe, language, people, and nation. And so. It, yeah. That would probably imply that it's people. And but so I don't, I don't know how that makes it pre-trib. Okay. Just because this is all happening before revelation chapter six with the seals. Cause the, the seals are, are not opened yet. Well, so. I, I think that, that only means it's pre-trib if you're right that we don't go to heaven when we die, that we go to the rapture. And I, I've i never even heard that before okay. it, today. I, I've heard that quite a fair bit among pre-trib people that I listen to, but um, I'm over the other side of the world, so we have a you know, different right. um, group of people here. And so with, with the rapture that you think is going to happen in Revelation chapter 7, um, so it says that there's an innumerable number of people there. Um, so uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, it says there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people. Now, I've heard some, some people say that, oh, the innumerable number means it's it, that means it's the rapture because you can't number it. But in the book of Luke, clearly they they clearly said that there's a new innumerable number there. So would you concede that that's not really a verse that we can use to say that that is definitely like the rapture of the church? We could we we can't say oh, because it's innumerable that means this is the rapture. You talking about Luke twelve? Uh, talking about Revelation chapter seven, and so. I might just no, it, it's it's not. Yeah, Revelation seven, it's not spelled out. Again, it's uh, assuming assuming our timing's right. Assuming we're right that the, um, you know, events of the seals, um, you know, that we're right that it comes after the sixth seal. I mean, it just it, it definitely looks right when right after the sixth seal, um, and in uh, Matthew twenty four when it talks about the sun being darkened and the moon darkened. You have Jesus coming in the clouds. Uh, it just, you know, people, to me, seeing a multitude from every kindred and tribe appear before the throne, that sounds a lot more like the rapture than Revelation 4, where one guy gets caught up in the spirit. Hmm. And so I guess in my opening statement, I sort of made a bit of a distinction between John. John is sort of like a, a symbolic um, you know, concept of he gets taken up. And when it says come up here, that it's exactly the same you know, King James words that the two um, two witnesses were taken up into heaven. The voice said come up hither, so that that's um, they were caught up to, uh, to God. But the the main concept is in, in Revelation chapter five, where there's twenty four elders, there's four beasts, and there's all these angels. But someone's from every tribe, language, people, and nation there. And it says we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Angels don't need redeeming. Um, the Beasts, I, I think they're Old Testament, you know, the, the seraphim, the cherubims and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I, so I suppose that's why some people have said the 24 elders are the church. I think the 24 elders are half the, the, from the 12 tribes of Israel uh, and half from the, the 12 apostles. And that's mentioned later on in the book of Revelation about the New Jerusalem that have these type of things all around it. Um, and the New Jerusalem is us. It is the church. It's not an actual building. And so that's why I would say that that's where I get the math and go, okay, 12 plus 12 equals 24. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but, yeah, 
So I'm not sure if you want to add anything more to that. I mean, no. I mean, I yeah, that, that's a good guess on who the 24 elders are, the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Uh, possible. Um, but yeah, it's it's all it's all speculation. Okay. <laughs> I would say it's um yeah, there, there's there is a lot of uh, biblical um, stuff there. Uh, so in a sense, um, we, we talked about Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 and um, the um, falling away. And so what's interesting in the Geneva Bible, it has the word departing, okay? Now, when you go to... Uh, the Geneva Bible uh, chapter headings, it actually says a falling away. So they saw the a falling away and a departing as synonymous. And so, um, yeah, some people thought it was a falling away from the Roman Catholics. Yeah, the, the Catholics thought that, oh, the Protestants have left, that's a falling away. And a lot of these people were amillennial. They had all sorts of weird concepts. And, yeah, they thought that the current Pope was the man of sin and all this sort of stuff. And so they had some pretty weird eschatology back then. But we understand the King James translated to the perfect job. Okay. So falling away, uh, we fall down to worship Christ. Um, I, I could say I fell down to worship Jesus, you know. Uh, sometimes there's a positive falling, like we fall in love, we fall asleep. Uh, to fall away is exactly what's uh, translated from uh, apo, from, and stasia, meaning to stand. And so it just means we're standing and we're taken away. And so the whole concept of rapture, harpazo, we're going to be snatched. Uh, we get, there's a, there's a, um, a thief who's Christ and he's going to take us like a thief in the night. We're, we're snatched, we're taken. So we're, we've fallen away from this earth. We're taken away. We've departed. Um, can, you, can you see that there or um, are you still not? Um, no, because that. if you, one thing that's really interesting study, if you read, I think it's Acts 17 and 18, that's specifically when Paul goes to Thessalonica and they're under great persecution or great, they're in, they're in tribulation and Paul wasn't able to spend a whole lot of time there. He had to leave. Uh, and so, you know, he's writing to a very new church with a lot of new believers uh, who are under a lot of persecution. And he, if, if, when you're, if you Ignore the end time stuff in First and Second Thessalonians and just pay very close attention to the actual message of the passage. You can tell, you can just see Paul pouring his heart out to these people, just concerned that the persecution they were under was going to cause them to, to give up and to stop serving the Lord and become unfruitful. And so, um, I, you know, I think when he's talking about the falling away or a you know failure to stand or wh whatever you want to call it, um, it's because it is prophesied that there is going to be a time where many people are going to, uh, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know, there's a, a time coming where a lot of people are going to fall out, and I do. I believe that's going to happen. Um, you know, when the Antichrist is revealed, I think a lot of people are going to punk out during that time and we don't ever want to see that kind of thing. And so he's uh, encouraging them to, you know, stand up for what they believe in. And we're doing the same thing today. Every pastor, uh, ever, you know, quite often feel like you have to preach a message, just reminding people to stand, to take a stand, to, to fight, to do all these things, but not everybody does. A lot of people still fall away and it's discouraging when that kind of thing happens and so again we're speculating you know no, none of this none of this proves anything the only thing we can we can know for sure i believe from reading second thessalonians 2 is that a falling away and the man of sin is revealed before the coming of our lord and our gathering together unto him and that is i don't know how you can make that a different event than what we see in first Thessalonians four. Okay. Um, so in um, second Thessalonians two, three, it says there will be a falling away first. And so um, usually that's like a, a primary type of thing. You know, it's, it's the very first thing in the, that's going to happen. And it doesn't say um, secondarily that man of sin will be revealed. 
And it doesn't say the man of sin will be revealed first. It, it's not part of that category. It says the falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. So it could be you know, two years later. It could be the next day. It could be five years later. It could be, you know, I believe it's three and a half years later. But um, Well, in or, the Bible, often when you see two things mentioned like that with an and, people always try to make it two different things. But sometimes that's a clarification. So falling away and that man of sin be revealed. Because, again, that I believe... It's my opinion that that is what the falling away is. People falling for the man of sin. He said, let no man deceive you. Jesus said the same thing. Let no man deceive you. And he then he specifically brought up false Christ. And so I, I believe that is my opinion on what the falling away is, is a great number of people accepting someone who is not Jesus as the Messiah. Okay. <clears throat> but um, so here it doesn't actually um, mention like a falling away from the faith, does it? It just says a falling away. No, yeah, just in general falling away. And then I think the mm -hmm. and is clarifying what that is. And because I believe it happens in that time. It's not going to be like one day. It'll be, you know, over a period of time. You know, I believe the Antichrist will rise to power and at some point, he will declare himself to be God, and many will follow him. And I, and I believe during that time, uh, he will implement the mark of the beast, and a lot of people are going to freak out. And you know, obviously, I don't believe saved people are going to take the mark, but I do believe many, 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 many who are. I, I think there's a lot of fake Christians, a lot of professing Christians out there, and um, I think there's going to be a separating of the sheep from the goats during that time. And that persecution and that tribulation, uh, it will it will weed it out. I believe it. I believe it will purify the church. You know, unfortunately, um, you, know, you know, the Bible talked about you know how the devil's going to sow tares among the wheat, and you you couldn't pull them all out yet because you know you're going to take the weed out with it. And again, I think, obviously, I think the ultimate separating of the wheat from the tares is going to be at the rapture. But I think there's going to be kind of, I think God is going to purify his church and pu purify the bride before he comes and gathers us up. And I and nothing, nothing purifies a church like some good old fashioned tribulation. Okay, so um so just listening to your revelation series, you said that um in Revelation chapter one, where it says um that Jesus was to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that this is, you know, shortly, it hasn't been, you know, it's been 2,000 years, it's not shortly, but, you know, one day with the Lord is 1,000 years, 1,000 years is one day. Um, the word here um, is tachos, where we get our word tachometer in a car, you know. Mm -hmm. So in Acts chapter 12, verse 7, it says, arise up quickly, uh, which means suddenly or instantly. You know, and, he, and he, then the chains fell off his hands. Luke 18, 8 says, and he will avenge them speedily or suddenly or instantly. Mm -hmm. um, and so would you agree that um, that this word shortly uh, could be misinterpreted to mean that it's going to be a, a duration of time um, when it actually is talking about a suddenness mm -hmm. and sort of talking about an in, imminency? Yeah, I, I, I do believe that it's possible that that could be um, how you would interpret that word. It is going to all these things are going to happen fast. And that becomes very clear, too, at the end of the book of Revelation. But even if it means shortly, uh, as in the sense of not very long from now in the book of Revelation, I think you said something about this earlier. Um, first off, he says he's going to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Well, I believe chapters two and three. Um, there are prophetic things for those specific churches that I believe came on them in that day. Things, you know, and so um, I think chapters two and three are events that would shortly come to pass. And then when you get to chapter four, it says, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so when you get to chapter four, I believe the events there are things that are going to be uh, way in the future. But you got to remember, that you know revelation was written to seven local churches 
in that day. And so it does. It starts out talking about things will shortly come to pass on them. Those are the things they're going to be paying the most attention to. We mainly pay attention to the stuff that's about us, uh, but they would have mainly paid attention to stuff that was about them. And those things did shortly come to pass. And then when you get to the end, he's kind of addressing the churches again. He's still addressing the churches. We forgot about them because they were 19 chapters ago. But um, I think it, you know, when it referenced shortly there again, too, it's because there were these things that John wrote about to people he knew in the flesh, not me, who wasn't even born yet, wasn't come for another 2000 years. You know, it's just a reminder to them, hey, be ready for these things. So uh, shortly, yeah, shortly first century, I think that's a good possibility. But the events of chapter two and three, um, four, show you things which must be hereafter. And we don't have a timeline on that. So. Okay. Um, so just with uh, with my model, which you sort of think is a bit of worth, worse than Ruckmanism, but that's fine. Uh, where the people who just say I was to die today, that I would go to the rapture and not go you know, sort of directly to heaven. I go to the rapture and then to heaven, like the next very next moment. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that model, um, <clears throat> I've forgotten my train of thought. Well, Sorry here's that. the question. If, if we go straight to the rapture, when do we sleep? According to humans, we sleep, but according to God, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. So immediately we're in the rapture and we're in the presence of Christ. Stephen saw the rapture. I don't understand how he saw the rapture. I just, in, in my opinion, um, when he saw Jesus standing there, uh, I believe we're seeing something exactly like we saw um, with Moses. Um when uh, he made intercession to God for Israel, when God was going to kill Israel um, after he saw they saw the golden calf. Every time we see God standing uh, at the throne in the Bible, I forgot the other place. I think Amos, there might be a reference. I forgot where it's at. It's usually he's mad. And I believe in my in my opinion, uh, when the, Stephen was preaching and uh, they were rejecting, I believe God was going to destroy Israel during that time and Stephen interceded like Moses for God said lay not this sin to their uh lay not the sin to their charge and God granted his request and God did not kill them then now uh what do we see immediately after that we see the introduction to Saul uh we start seeing God go to the Gentiles and uh the book of Acts we see constant attempts from the apostles to try to get um Israel to repent they never they never did. And uh, when we get to Acts chapter 28, even after Paul uh, left his thriving ministry to go make an attempt to get Israel saved, um, even though his brethren tried to stop him, they were told him by the Holy Ghost not to go. Um, after he goes on trial and everything, uh, we see in there that um, most of the Jews didn't believe and Acts 28, it concludes saying, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, a prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and saying, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed. And it goes on, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. Israel never got saved. And Israel... Uh, probably less than 10 years after what we're seeing there in Acts chapter 28, uh, they had their tribulation and they were not delivered because they never did call on the Lord. They could have. I mean, Paul said, and so all Israel shall be saved is, and this is how they'll be saved. But if it's if they abide not still in unbelief. And unfortunately, they stayed in unbelief and they got theirs and they're done. And now... Uh, what we have today that people are calling Israel, uh, they've put that name of blasphemy on themselves, is basically the rise of the beast, uh, uh, if you want my opinion, on that, the rise of the beast system. And um, it's not totally there yet. You know, um, its deadly wound hasn't been healed yet. But, uh, but yeah, but uh, I, I forgot where we were going with that. But... <clears throat> But yeah, but I guess, yeah, so the stoning of Stephen, 
I believe Jesus was standing because he was, it's, it's my opinion, he was going to kill that. He was going to kill Israel. I've got a whole sermon I did on that, and, and Stephen stopped him. Opinion. Yeah. Um, Donnie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say we are in bonus minutes. And so maybe, Nick, if it's okay with you, if there's anything you'd like to respond to what Tommy just said, maybe save it for the for the closing statement. I guess, Nick, you started the conversation, so maybe we'll we'll give uh, Tommy the last word as we move into five minute closing statements, if that works, gentlemen. Okay. okay. All right, cool. Uh, so we got 10 minutes left, basically 10 more minutes for our uh, audience to send in final questions for uh, for this debate. So, Nick, you did start the debate. So we're going to give you a five minute concluding statement where you can uh, wrap up your thoughts and points. And so whenever you're ready, the floor is yours, Nick. Go ahead. OK, and so um, uh I appreciate uh, this, Donny. I really appreciate you um, inviting me on to your program. And so um, I've counted seven resurrection slash raptures that happen in the book of uh, Revelation. So we have the, the church, Revelation chapter four, um, has a, a symbology of John going up. Um, now, we, we know that uh, Philip, he was actually raptured and found somewhere else in the book of Acts. So it does talk about these type of things happening. John went up and obviously he remained alive. And But the the main rapture that's, um, that it's talking about there is in Revelation chapter 5, where it talks about from every tribe and language and people and nation, who is it? Is it? It's got to be someone there. And so to me, it makes sense that these are the innumerable angels. So clearly all the way through the book of Revelation, it's saying angels can be humans. Uh, that same word, angelos, is used for John the Baptist. I will send a messenger before your face. The, the word messenger in the King James is actually exactly the same um, word as angel there. Um, so then we see tribulation saints, which these guys are saying is their rapture. But to me, it says that they're all dead. It says that in, in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, I think it's verse 9 where it says um, that they're all going to die. So th it's not a resurrection. It's not a rapture of the living. Okay, so then we see the two witnesses are taken up and it says the same words that it said to John, come up hither. It's exactly the same in the English. It's exactly the same in the Greek, but plural. Um, and then we see a harvest um, in, oh, sorry, we see the 144,000 all of a sudden before the throne. Um, we see a harvest uh, in Revelation 14 as, again. Then we see overcomers of the mark of the beast and everything like that in Revelation chapter 15. And then at the second coming, we see a gathering of everyone from everywhere. From one end of heaven to the other. There's got to be people in heaven for that. And there's also people get being gathered from earth. If you, if you read the parallels in the in the Gospels, you see that. And so um, clearly um, the the falling away first. Now, what what would you think? Paul's saying, look, I've told you about this. What was one of the main features, last day's features of the previous book that he wrote? There is going to be a, it's a mystery. He says that in 1 Corinthians. And he says, there is going to be a catching up, a harpazo. So harpazo means you're getting kidnapped. You're getting snatched. So here it says it's going to be falling away. And it's like, don't you remember I told you all about this? To me, it makes perfect sense. It fits in perfectly. Um, when you go through the timing, the blood moon is simply not mentioned in, you know, after the tribulation, this will happen. And it's, most of the time it's skipped over and it's said very fast. But when you study through these things slowly, ah, the blood moon's not in that particular passage. So we can't say that that's clearly talking about a blood moon passage because other times in the book of Revelation is talking about the sun being darkened. Other times it's talking about stars falling. Other times it's talking about all sorts of things, but we're focused on the moon thing or the blood moon. Oh, that means it's darkened as well. No, you've got to be careful when not... Uh, doing what um, John MacArthur does with the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and just saying, well, they're the same thing. These are clearly different things, blood moon and the, sun being, uh, the moon being darkened. Um, and so I, I think uh, my case has been presented here pretty well. Um, I can't see. I was open to this position. I put my, um, my feet in the shoes of... Donnie, I'm still reading through his book. A lot of really good information that I would agree with. And I think we actually agree on a lot more, you know, than preterists and other people, you know. Um, and so, but I, I can't, 
I'm, I'm at, the more that I'm studying it, the more I'm seeing pre-trip everywhere. Seeing it in Revelation chapter 12 with the child that's caught up is Jesus. But we become one with Christ when we become born again. We we become one with Jesus. But Paul said, why are you persecuting me? Um, the, the, uh, sorry, Jesus said to Paul, why are you persecuting me? And so um, Jesus and the church are one, one flesh. And so when it says uh, that uh, he is caught up to heaven, and then it says in the woman's in the wilderness, probably Israel going to the world in the great tribulation. Uh, to me, that makes perfect sense as well. I, I'm, I'm starting to see through the book of Revelation and just see pre-trib absolutely everywhere. I can't I can't get around it. I'm, and um, I guess, you know, Tommy might have heard some of the things that I'm talking about. That's because I'm doing my own study. He can say that I'm Clar Clarence Larkinite or I'm a, 30 you know, seconds. following Ruckman or whatever. But it, clearly there's enough in my presentation for him to know that, I am thinking independently and then I'm looking at the scriptures. I'm also looking at everything, but I'm making my own conclusions on this. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Nick, thank you very much for that five minute concluding statement. We're now going to hand it over to Tommy McMurtry. You also have a five minute concluding statement. And so when you're ready, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah. So if we're, if we're saying things like, pre-tribulation or even post-tribulation and we're talking about a seven-year event you know we are our, our thinking has definitely been tainted and um i i've i've been calling people to get back to bible terminology when we're talking about daniel's 70th week and then talking about global events instead of jerusalem uh we're, we've been tainted by clarence larkin when all our charts including post-trib ones say daniel's 70th week and the tribulation and the great tribulation We've clearly been tainted by Larkin and his language has confused. And I think one of the reasons um, you know, we often struggle in these conversations and it's kind of gone to some weird places. There is a lot of talking past each other that goes on because we're not defining things the same. And um, you, know, you mentioned seven raptures. I believe that is another thing to just muddy the waters. So, yeah, seven catchings away. Yeah, Enoch got raptured. Elijah got raptured. But wait a minute, why don't, let's call it the resurrection. Now, here's why people don't want to call it the resurrection. If we do, we might associate it with Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, Live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And right there, we see those who did not take the mark and were beheaded. They are a part of the first resurrection, separate from the resurrection that comes after the thousand years were finished. And in 1 Corinthians 15, that is the resurrection passage of the Bible. And, and uh, Old Testament saints will be with us. Our resurrection is the same as the Old Testament saints. In Matthew 8, verse 10, when the centurion shows this great faith, when Jesus heard it marvel and said unto him that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness or shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. We're going up the same time as them. Daniel 12 ta talked about a resurrection. At that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even at that same time. And thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book, and many of them which sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. Now, it was not revealed in Daniel 12, that those events were going to be separated by a thousand years, but we can learn that from the book of revelation spelled out in revelation 20, Job 19, Job believed in a resurrection. He said, I know my redeemer liveth and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh, shall I see God? They always believed in a resurrection. Now, Paul revealed the mystery of the changed body. He did not reveal the rapture like many dispensationalists, many Ruckmanites teach. Paul revealed the rapture and then they go to, I show you a mystery. It's about a changed body, not the coming of Christ and for sure not the resurrection. They believe in that. Hebrews 11 talked about how 
Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promise, uh, received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall I see be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham believed in a resurrection. Uh, uh, you know, Martha said to Jesus, talking about Lazarus, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Acts 4, and I'm skipping a bunch. And they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon him, being grieved that they taught the people, talking to Jews, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The Jews, the Pharisee side, believed in the resurrection. They got mad that they were preaching it, that it was through Jesus. Why? Because we have the same resurrection that they do. Uh, and and so um, in, in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, Paul said, talking about Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth of error, it's saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. That is the event that everyone else wants to call the rapture. It's the resurrection and many more we could go. But again, the reason we can't call it the resurrection is because You'll associate it with the one in Revelation 20 that happens to those who refuse to take the mark of the beast. But you know what? You should because it's the same thing. Okay, Tommy, thank you very much for the five minute concluding statement. That wraps up the concluding statement. So appreciate the debate. Uh, you both kept it professional, civil, with a lot of uh, interesting discussion back and forth on some good questions. So, okay, we've got enough questions from the audience to easily keep us busy for the next 30 minutes. So let's do about 30 minutes of questions and we'll just start right from the beginning. And so, uh, let's see. First question I think that came in was from uh, Nick. And the question is not specifying anybody. So we'll work through it together and, and kind of figure it out. So uh, Nick says, Paul says we meet Jesus in the clouds at the rapture. Jesus says he will be in the clouds in Matthew 24, 29 to 30 after the tribulation of those days. Is there any verses where he's in the clouds pre-trib? Okay, so it sounds like it's more directed at you, Nick. And so let's uh, let's give you the floor. Go ahead. Okay, so um, what I've, I've found is when you go through all of these resurrections that happen in um, the book of Revelation, and that are described elsewhere, there's usually common features, like Jesus going up into the uh, sky. I mean, there's not much in the sky. There's clouds, you know. <laughs> and so usually that's sort of mentioned. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it mentions there's clouds, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes we should probably read into some of these verses that there are clouds. I know some people will just get the list of clouds and go, see, that, that proves that this one's, lining up with this one and but i i I, tr I do do that but i try not to be um absolutely too dogmatic with that i think if it was if it was saying a, a particular black rain cloud or something i go oh that's different and if it was mentioned somewhere else i'd i'd look at that but it's just a, a generic sort of uh, jesus is caught up in the clouds uh, this is um you know it, it talks about um you know the the rapture passage in one Thessalonians, it talks about, we, you know, he's coming in the clouds of heaven, um, the gathering at, at um, in Matthew 24, it talks about clouds. And so, um, yeah, I would say there's, there's similarities in all these uh, resurrections. Sometimes there's harpers. And when you go through a lot of this, the 24 elders turn up a lot as well. So it's, oh, they turned up. Oh, they're there again, but sometimes they're not there. And it's like, I wonder why they're not there. I think maybe just John just went, I think they'll get that. Once they're around the throne, they're around all these other people that are previously mentioned sort of thing. So. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, Tommy, floor is yours. Yeah, so when Jesus ascended to heaven, it was visible. Everyone saw it, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Later after that, an angel said, Why stand you gazing into heaven? The same Jesus was taken from you. Shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. His return will not be secret. His return will be visible. He told that to... Uh, the you know the 120 there on the Mount of Olives, and behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, uh, I think all the references to Jesus coming in the clouds uh, is a reference to the resurrection, and it's a reference to him coming just uh, the same in the same manner that he went into heaven. And so, um, I'm going to 
I'm just going to throw this out. Nah, I won't throw that out. Maybe, maybe if we have time later. But yeah, I think it's all the same thing. Okay. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, Nick, question was for you. Let's give you the last word. Um, I think it was actually for both of us, but that, that's cool. I, I've sort of said what I needed to say there anyway, I think. Okay. Oh, cool. We'll, we'll consider it a question for the both of you. So, okay, let's move on to the next question. And let's see here. Apologies if a lot of these questions are kind of focused on things that you both did discuss during the debate, but that's kind of the nature of these questions. So, um, okay, let's go. Question from Morph Wales. Question for both, Nick and Tommy. In Revelation 19 and 20 speaks of Jesus coming back, etc., and says this is the first resurrection. How does this fit in your belief in regards to the rapture? I guess, Nick, since you started with the last one, uh, Pastor, why don't we start with you on this one? Yeah, I, I believe that's the first resurrection, uh, separated only from the resurrection of Christ. Christ the first fruits afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. That's that's it. And I believe that's the resurrection. There's a resurrection of the just and the unjust. I didn't even uh, read all the passages that we had on that. Um, but um, but yeah, no, it, it fits. It fits perfectly. Now, I don't know what you do if you're pre-trib because uh, the pre-tribbers make that a separate resurrection that happens, you know, after the tribulation, uh, after the seven years. Um, but that would make it the first resurrection. Thank you, Pastor. Nick, floor is yours. Yeah, I think um, there's specifically, like, there's lots of re resurrections that happen, um, which I've just gone through, you know, the, the seven that, that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Some of them we, we would say that are for the living, some for the dead and, and things like that. But um, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, it says um, that this is the first resurrection. And so this is after what I would consider, you know, Jesus has come back. Um, he's... On, on the horse and so th this is this ties in with um uh matthew 24 where he's gathered everyone there together and so it talks about um after the thousand years in that verse it says the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection and then it says blessed and holy that he has um sorry blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power so um, the first resurrection is sort of like a, like everyone who has ever gone to be with Christ, whether it's a pre-trib or whether it's, you know, these other people getting resurrected throughout these periods of time. They're all gathered together. And then we all go to the judgment seat of Christ and we judge all the sinners with Christ. The Bible says we will judge angels, we'll judge the world. We will sit there with Christ judging you know, our friends, our family, we, we will judge those who have been, who have come out of hell and they will be cast into the lake of fire. And so that's the second resurrection. You don't want to be part of that crew. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Question was for the both of you. So let's move on to the next question comes in from brother Dave question for Tommy. If post trib is true, why is the tribulation called Jacob's trouble? How does that mean something to everyone? Here's why the tribulation is called Jacob's trouble. That's why. The, the time of Jacob's trouble uh, in Jeremiah chapter 30, um, I believe it's primarily about um, the Babylonian, uh, the, you know, the Babylonians coming and taking over. Now, like many prophecies, while it was there was an immediate um fulfillment of on that generation i do believe um it was a foreshadowing of what we see talked about in matthew 24 and the destruction of jerusalem but um you know at, at the same time yeah the time of jacob's trouble that happened a long time ago revelation never calls it that and here and what everybody needs to get a hold of when it comes to uh getting being consistent on your bible prophecy is that um you know, there are, you know, like I said, I, I do believe there's such a thing as dual fulfillments, but we're getting really dot. We're, we're forgetting about all the stuff that was fulfilled um, when the prophecies were originally given in that generation. And we're making all of it about things in the future. And one of the things we see in Matthew chapter 24 and in um, Jeremiah 30, we won't take time to go to those scriptures, but it talks specifically um, that those 
who are going to be saved out of it are those who are written in the book. Well, what's interesting about that, if you go to Psalms, when it's prophesying 100% clearly about the Jews, uh, prophesying about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it talks about, it's saying, let them not be written with the righteous. Let them not be uh, in the book of living. So the thing is, people want to make that all about Israel. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and when the time of Jacob's trouble came, uh, they did. They got in a lot of trouble. And so I do believe in dual, triple fulfillments and things like that. And But uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, it was specifically about trouble for Jacob um, during the Babylonian period. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Nick, floor is yours. Yes, sir. Um, the phrase Jacob's trouble comes from Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Uh, it says, alas, for the day is great, um, so that none is like it. Uh, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Um, and so it's my view that um, with what we see uh, clearly in the book of Revelation, uh, with the 144,000, uh, that these come from the 12 tribes. Uh, when we're looking at the woman in um, uh, Revelation uh, chapter 12, uh, you know, with the um, 12 stars around her head, clearly to me, this is um, this is Israel. Um, and uh, so I, I think there, God is able to multitask. Um, he can do many things. He can judge the world and judge Israel at the same time. Um, but it does talk about that these these uh, uh, Hebrew, these Israeli aspects are in the uh, the book of Revelation. And so um, when it comes to this verse, it talks talking about a time that there will be none like it. So this is the same language that was used by Jesus. There will be uh, a time of tribulation and it, it never has been before and never will be again. And so um, that's, if you usually look up in the Bible, that's usually referenced to there. So to me, uh, Jacob's trouble is talking about that um, time of tribulation. Okay, thank you, Nick. Pastor, question was for you. You can have the last word. Yeah, another thing you have to remember too, whenever you start bringing up what ended up happening with Israel, because while you have a lot of prophecies that are geared you know, towards Israel, um, what people often accuse you of doing is claiming that God broke his promise to Israel, blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously God's going to keep all his promises. What we have to talk about is how is he going to keep his promise? Is he going to keep his promises to Israel through a, a lineage of physical people, of flesh and blood that the Bible says can't inherit the kingdom of God? Or is he going to fulfill his promises to Israel through someone who came from Israel, Jesus Christ, and those who are in Christ? And so, um, again, while many of those prophecies are specifically about events that already took place. You can't get past the fact that there is definitely a message for the future that's contained within that. So then we have to ask ourselves a question, considering everything that happened with Israel, considered they rejected uh, the Messiah. Um, you know, how is God going to keep his promise? He keeps his promises through Jesus Christ. And Jesus was of Israel. And those who rejected Jesus Christ, they were cut off of the olive tree. But those who believe they were grafted in to the olive tree. And so um, all the promises are going to be fulfilled, but they are fulfilled through Christ who was of Israel. Okay, thank you very much, Pastor, for the final word. Okay, next question comes in from, let me see here. Uh Okay, we got a super chat here. Not really addressed to anybody specifically. We'll read it together and um, just kind of engage it. So Ashley Myers, thank you for the support. Question. LV renders 2 Thessalonians 2.2 2 as day of the Lord, not day of Christ. Guessing that's what that means. I see resurrection. Question in Revelation 1, 7, and 10, where John is called up to the judgment seat of Christ, where he sees reward slash punish rendered. Um, any thoughts, Tommy and Nick? I can't say I fully understand the question, but. Um, well, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I understand the question fully either. I don't know. 
how she uh, he got called up to the judgment seat. I'm thinking she's probably heard that because people think John got, you know, him being caught up to heaven is like in the rapture. Um, but uh, yeah, that I I don't think I fully understand the question, so I probably shouldn't try to answer it. <laughs> no worries, Ashley. If you are in the chat, I understand the. Um... When you're typing the questions, there, there's a limit to the amount of text you can put. So if you wanted to uh, send anything in terms of clarification, feel free to do so. Nick, any thoughts from you? Um, so I think she means LV by living version, uh, renders Second Thessalonians as day of the Lord and not day of Christ. So this is a textual variant in um, Second Thessalonians there. And so um, the day of the Lord um, is usually, it, it is a polyseme which uh, can relate to the day when uh, Jesus came in the first period, uh, his first coming. Other times it's related to um, the second coming, like in Joel, um, that great and um, notable day of the Lord come. And, and so um, in Joel, uh, it talks about the, the second coming, which I would think is in Revelation chapter 19. That's the, the day of the Lord. But then there's other scriptures that talk about the whole entire, you know, sort of tribulation period, what we would label that as being the day of the Lord. Uh, so I think the day of Christ is actually um, the rapture. I think the day of the Lord is on the same day that is triggered and that the, the day of the Lord continues on right up until uh, the heaven and earth are destroyed. It says that in Second Peter chapter 3, I think, where it's, you know, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night and wherein all the elements are destroyed. So it is a polyseme, which means that it's it has multiple um, meanings. And so we've got to put that in its correct context. And so, um, so yeah, hopefully that, that helps there. I, I can't see the rest of that question. Uh, the rapture... Well, I think for some more... So it sounds like she's saying that she sees the rapture in Revelation 1, 7, and 10. The LV is the Latin Vulgate that she's referring to okay. and then she said chat's flying so i think i lost it oh right here so she's arguing it sounds like revelation two and three is the judgment seat of christ and so maybe the rapture before that is what i'm understanding uh, pastor any any thoughts on that well i do think revelation 1 7 is the rapture but um i think john is just kind of kicking off the book you know talking about the coming of christ and um this isn't something that he saw yet. This is something that he's just, um, you know, referring to, you know, because what he's bringing up there is talked about in the book of Zechariah. So he didn't really need to see that to write that down. That was something that was already prophesied. And so Revelation 2 and 3 being the judgment seat of Christ, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I just, I think that that was John writing specifically to seven churches that he knew and uh he gave all of them a copy of this entire letter uh i think as a way to preserve it because it was going to be very very important for future generations it, obviously um certain sections of chapter two were more you know the section to ephesus was more important to uh to them than it was to the church in smyrna uh, and so on but uh chapter four uh on it was something that the rest of us were definitely going to need and so um, I think yeah, everything in chapter two and three that was prophesied has been fulfilled. It's happened. Um, and then four, four on, uh, you know, you could say future. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tommy. Anything uh, you'd like to quickly add before we move to the next question, Nick? Yes. Yeah, so just um, uh, talking about Revelation chapter 2 and 3, I think we would both be in agreement that the whole concept that these are periods of time that sort of stretch over the last 2,000 years is is a wrong concept. And, um, you know, we, we would I, I've never gelled with that. I, I've always just heard it and just gone, that, that just sounds really weird. And where do they get the, the when these periods of time end and things like that? So maybe she's talking about that. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I would say that these seven churches and what's written there it's just like getting the book of ephesians when you read it you apply it to them and you apply it to yourself uh, and you do the seven churches you should do that to yourself too you, you read it and you go oh that applies to me it applied to them as well and so and that's that's it with those two chapters okay thank you nick all right let's move on to the next question comes in from 357 trent question for nick 
How can Matthew 24, 29 to 31 not be the rapture, but is the event in Revelation 19 when Matthew 24 looks nothing like Revelation 19 as it looks identical to the rapture? Really good question. And um, I have seen some of Donnie's charts where he's got Matthew 24 and he's got um, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, four and he's got them together and you go okay there's the cloud and there's the trumpet and there's this and the, and it's like, okay but see to me uh, that sort of happens at every resurrection rapture um th that that type of thing and so um because something is not really mentioned there um i, I would i would say there is a uh, a gathering of people because we've all been uh gathered the new jerusalem is not long after that mentioned and so that we've all been gathered there because New Jerusalem is the actual church. So um, when we go through this, it's clearly um, the second part of the three and a half years because it doesn't mention in Matthew 24 anything about the blood moon thing, where it does mention that in the book of Revelation uh, chapter 6 at the first three and a half years, it talk, talking about that. And so uh, the day of the Lord comes um after that and so the day of the lord in that context being the second coming and so when you look at other verses that are talking about the uh second coming in the old testament um when you look look at all the other verses that clearly you know talk about the second coming in the new testament and you put them all together that's how you get that um picture um but just to go you know there and there and so like, okay that that seems a bit different so what i actually did i actually got the two witnesses and i put their rapture up with matthew 24 there were clouds there was a, a taking up there was it was quite a lot of similarity They're like not not a, not heaps but there was enough there to go oh maybe you're talking about that sort of thing but um because in the 24 context it's talking about you know um a lot more people not just two people but i think that we sometimes we can be reading into things. Thank you, Nick. Pastor, floor is yours. Yeah. So um, I hate to just like throw questions out there and not just give answers, but I'm just going to be real honest because here's when it comes to Revelation, we all like to have a contest of who takes it the most literal, but there clearly are very symbolic passages in there. You know, Revelation 12, you know, nobody expects a woman to be clothed with the sun. You know, obviously that means something. Uh, but anytime you get symbolic about something that people have taken as literal, uh, you get accused of all kinds of things. But let me just throw something out there, okay? Um, in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints and that obviously is the resurrection uh we saw where paul said in chapter four already even though them which sleep in jesus will uh, god bring with him uh and when we're going to be caught up together with them those that god brings with him at the resurrection so here's my here's a question i've been asking everybody people on my side um and i asked pre is the same question why is the event in Revelation 19 where Jesus Christ is coming in the clouds with his saints, not the event of 1 Thessalonians 4 where Jesus Christ is coming in the clouds with his saints? And, and here's, here's why I think it's not for most people. Because of this and our charts, even post-trib ones that have been influenced by that. Um, now, again, I still think it is you know a different event but I don't think it's proof positive. I don't think that's super clear. I think you got to really do your due diligence. If you're going to tell somebody that that event where Jesus Christ is coming in the clouds with the saints is a completely different event just because he's on a horse. Um, you know, so, uh, but at the same time too, I think you got to even do more convincing to tell me that Matthew 24, where Jesus is, coming in the clouds and gathering people up is not the event of first Thessalonians chapter four. So I think we've let the pre-tribbers and the dispensationalists separate events so much that I think maybe post-tribbers could have a separation that isn't completely necessary. And, and I know that's going to just fry the gizzards of a lot of people, but um, uh, I, I won't take the time to go into those things. I do have, 
uh, some theories on how that could still be true. Uh, because here's another thing too. I don't know. And you know, Nick, I don't know if you do this, but most people associate um, revelation 19 with Armageddon, even though, you know, uh, yeah, a lot of people do, uh, they I associate it with, that. It was pretty good. Yeah. With revelation 14, where, uh, the blood is flowing to the horse's bridles. Um, the you know, which Jehovah, is but... also in talk about in Joel, uh, the, you know, the, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, I think everyone is taking events from a timeline they got from Larkin and trying to put it in there somewhere. And uh, most are put in Revelation 19. And I think um, some of what we're, I think we could possibly be seeing uh, in Revelation 19 is a fulfillment of some prophecies um, that were geared towards Jerusalem that never were fulfilled because of their rejection. And I believe the fulfillment is going to be something that happens more uh, globally. And so that, that event we see in Revelation 19, we're trying to force it into an event we see in Joel and Zechariah about Jerusalem. But maybe what we're seeing there is symbolic of Jesus Christ coming to the whole world, gathering up the elect. And then what does he do? Uh, when he, after he gathers up the rest of us, you know, he throw the rest of the world comes under God's wrath. So I don't know, you know, I've got a lot of theories and speculation on it, but you know what? Everybody's speculating on revelation 19 and, and, and we just need to admit it. Everyone's speculating revelation 19 and people are trying to use it as proof of stuff. And the biggest thing that pre-tribbers do is they try to prove revelation 19 and Matthew 24 are the same event. And therefore, it can't be the event of 1 Thessalonians 4. But no, 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 24 are definitely the same event. And if Revelation 19 and Matthew 24 are the same event, then uh, it's the same as 1 Thessalonians 4. No, no two ways about it. So um, I know that doesn't really help, but I want I want somebody on my side because I want Revelation 19. I want my position on Revelation 19 to still be right. But I need somebody to give me a real good Bible explanation for why that event is different from the one we see in first Thessalonians four. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hearing crickets. Tommy, appreciate it. If I can throw in my own question mm -hmm. and, and get a response for you out of curiosity, since we don't see the trumpet and vile judgments described in Matthew 24, mm -hmm. or we don't see hail and fire being cast upon the earth. We don't see locusts coming out of the bottomless pit, for example. So we don't see that described in Matthew 24 leading up to Jesus coming in the clouds, mm -hmm. but we do see the trumpet and vile judgments leading up to Revelation 19. Do mm -hmm. you believe that this is a plausible reason for separating the the rapture and the battle of Armageddon? In yeah, Revelation no, and, 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 and that that is a, um, a very... To me, the best reason, I just don't know if it's proof because um, Revelation reveals many details about the wrath of God that there are no references to in the Old Testament. You know, John is revealing a lot of new stuff. So the, so the thing is, um, yeah, that it is, it is possible, assuming what we're seeing is chronological. Uh, the problem is... Um, if that is the case, then um, we can't say the second half of Revelation is as chronological as we think, because I think everybody puts Revelation 14, uh, part of it is the rapture and part of it is Armageddon. And so um, I guess there's just there's inconsistencies on there. And I think it's one of those things where it's theory, you know, based on assumptions. And I'm not sure we've actually proved anything with that. And I just want to make sure we, we're, we're proving it. I tend to think uh, it does come after that, but not 100%. Okay, I appreciate that uh, well thought out response, uh, Pastor Tommy. Nick, over to you if you want to, of course, to be fair, if you want to answer this question, but also the uh, question that I kind of threw in there as well, feel free to do so. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think um, with your question there, Donnie, it does say that uh, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. 
And then, you know, the, uh, we'll see the sign of the Son of Man. Um, it says in Luke 21, it says, there should be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, waves of the sea roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking at those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And in Mark 13, um, it says the stars shall, shall fall. So we, we get this idea. It's going to be rad, you know. Um, so to me, that's just a summary of what's going to happen in the last three and a half years of you know, the judgments. And But Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, stand up, lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. You know, when they begin, uh, it says, pray always, um, watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things and to stand before the, the, the Son of Man. So I think we can escape all these things. If we are uh, born again, we will go in the rapture. All, the, all that stuff you just said there, though, that describes Revelation 6. Do you think Revelation 6 and 19 are the same? Uh, no, because it's, it's not mentioning the um, the moon turning to blood. So it's just saying the moon is darkened. And so it's definitely not talking about that period of time. And when and it's talking about the tribulation. In Revelation 6, people saying, hide us from the Lamb, from the face of him that is you know, upon the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the greater of his wrath is coming. That... That sounds a lot like what you were just describing there. But yeah, and so I guess we're we're both looking at it with with a different chart each, mm -hmm. and um, we're both looking at different um, goalposts, and so. But um, that's how I see it from my position. Okay. Um, all right. We'll move on. Appreciate the responses from the both of you, Tommy and Nick. Definitely an interesting uh, topic. So, okay, Stephen Tibbetts, question for Nick. If according to the Bible, we still see the man of sin revealed, and this happens at the midpoint, how do you support pre-trib? Won't that cause many to stop believing? Um, according to the Bible, we see the man of sin revealed, and this happens at the midpoint. How do you support pre-trib? Um, well, I believe the uh, falling away happens first, and then that man of sin will be revealed. Um, and so uh, my understanding, like I know a lot of people say, well, the Antichrist is the first horse. It's the Antichrist. Um, it doesn't say that. It just says it's the white horse, um, and the, he, he's a conqueror. And so I remember hearing that as a new Christian. I was like, where does it say the Antichrist? And looked and looked, and just because it's got a white horse, and people think, well, Jesus is coming in a white horse, so it must be... Yeah, he's antichrist he's in place of christ and all that um so i i don't think there's going to be any problem with my position in the midpoint when um and so you're saying here according to the bible we will see the man of sin revealed i i don't see the man of sin revealed it says and then shall that man of sin be revealed so if, if what he's saying is he's using uh, terminology saying, look, if you're in the tribulation period, that seven year period, you would see this man of sin. You know, he would be there. You know, the, the uh, falling away would have happened already. Uh, you know, these sort of things. And so, um, so yeah, I, I don't think that will stop anyone believing. I think um, we won't even be here. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Tommy, floor is yours. I mean, yeah, that's not a problem for me at all. I mean, I think that we are going to see the man of sin revealed. I think uh, Paul was telling them, uh, hey, don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, you know, the day of Christ is at hand. That day is not going to come except certain things take place first. There's going to be a falling away and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I don't think he's saying those are two different events. I think it's the same event, the falling away and through the man of sin being revealed and people believing him when he opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God. So that he is God who sits in the temple of temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, um, and will it, wouldn't that cause many to stop believing uh, again, if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. I believe true spirit, you know, uh, believers with the Holy spirit will not, uh, fall for it, but I believe many professing, believers who do not have the holy spirit and there's a lot of them out there today they will in fact uh be deceived and um so yeah it, it it's going to happen and it's going to be discouraging for a lot of folks even if you're saved watching people that you thought were saved worship the antichrist that's going to be discouraging i mean it's discouraging enough now just watching people that you thought were saved 
um, just get out of church and quit serving the Lord. But that kind of thing is going to happen. And they were dealing with it in that day, you know, and that's why Paul was uh, trying so hard to just comfort these guys in their tribulations. You know, it's interesting if you look at the difference in the way Paul wrote to the Thessalonians versus how he wrote to the Corinthians. You know, Corinthians, he's getting all over them where the, the Thessalonians, he's just he's just loving on them. He's just trying to comfort them. You can see the concern. And it was because they were in tribulation. The Corinthian church, they were just carnal. That was their problem. They weren't, it wasn't, they were in tribulation. They were just carnal. These guys were going through tribulation. Okay. Thank you for the response, Tommy. Question was for you, Nick. You can have the last word. Yeah, I think um, understanding the falling away here um, is key. The falling away first, understanding that this is synonymous with a departure. And like I was saying in my wife's Urdu Bible, it's translated as Exodus. And, and it's a perfectly good um reasonable translation of it because it just means a departure, whether it's a departure from the faith and that's added to it um, or a great departure or whatever. But it's um, yeah, understanding that that is a, uh, a rapture. Uh, to me, that's an absolute game changer. And so to know that that happens first and then that man of sin is revealed. And so um, once you've got that chronological sequence there, it, it makes perfect sense that um, it's a pre-trib position and um, no one will stop believing because we will be taken up and raptured. Can, can you not see how saying that the falling away is the rapture makes no sense when he says, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. You know, let no man deceive the day of Christ. I think the coming of the Lord, I think the gathering, I think the day of Christ. I think we all agree are the rapture so he's saying that day the rapture can't come until the falling away happens first that doesn't make sense you can't say christmas can't come until christmas comes yeah i guess in a sense um where i, I did sort of mention before the day of christ and the day of the lord are sort of a synonymous uh, type of event one for christians that's um where we will see christ the the other one for um for unbelievers, it's the day of the Lord has has occurred, and you're left behind. You're in trouble, and so um, that that makes perfect sense here. When you read it through and don't skip verse two, it says, um, "Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him." So He's saying, "I'm going to be talking about these topics here. Don't be soon." There's that word "soon." It just means quickly or suddenly. That's um, like I was talking about Revelation one. Shaken in mind or be troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. So understand the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are synonymous. And so that's why I've always said here, the textual variant that says the day of the Lord here, even though it is a textual variant, it doesn't change the doctrine here. It's just like, okay, day of the Lord, day of, the, day of Christ. But I go with the um, day of Christ here, but it doesn't really affect my teaching. But is is that day, to maybe clarify Tommy's point, that day cannot come until, is that day referring to the rapture in your view, Nick? Uh, that day is talking about the beginning of the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is a period of time. And so that would be the the um, the time of the tribulation period from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 19 as, or, or, or it goes even beyond that to right to the judgment. But that's that, that starts. The wrath of the Lamb has come. The day of Christ has come. Um, so, yeah. You, you see, this right here is one of the things that got me looking because this just feels like everyone's interpreting their bible with the assumption we know it's pre-trib therefore the only way to interpret this passage is this but wait a minute what if you're wrong about it being pre-trib and i feel like that's what everyone is doing and this i mean i just i i feel like we're really twisting big time to to force that in there and that's why i it just it seems to me and 
you know, and I, I, I said, I don't know you and I, I don't know that you're independent fundamental Baptist or anything, but in the independent fundamental Baptist world, when I listen to so many people preach in the pre-trib and they all do it different, I have so many books teaching on the pre-trib doctrine. Nobody interprets Matthew 24 the same. No two guys in, in, in and I, there's always somebody, you know, there's somebody who's just like a, uh, guys seeing who's the most like Ruckman or who's most like their favorite guy. But I just feel like everybody's going into this with this attitude. There can be no other conclusion but pre-trib, and it don't matter how you get there as long as you get there. And it's just one of those things where I'm telling independent fundamental Baptists who do not agree with each other on Bible interpretation, you can't expect me to just submit to this. It's you guys aren't consistent. You don't make sense. And this is, these are huge, huge stretches that just, I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do about that. And so I, you know, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but um, what you're describing with second Thessalonians two, I mean, should make every pre-tribber be cringing out of their mind right now. But you know, uh, you know, not trying to be mean. I heard one pastor that I like a lot and respect. Uh, he read second Thessalonians two and was preaching out of that one time and, uh, read, don't, you know, let no man see by any means or, um, uh, about the day of Christ being at hand. I'm, I'm, I'm not quoting it right at the time, but he was like, he used that verse to prove the day of Christ was at hand. And I'm just like, what in the world? You know, it's just, you can do, and, and, and Ruckmanites are proof of this. You can do, Whatever you want with the scriptures, as long as you conclude pre-trib, people don't care. I just, I think that, I think that's weird. And I just, I feel like, I feel like this guy is just in everyone's head and we got it. We got to get him out of our heads. We got to stop using his terms. We've got to stop using his charts. We, we don't want to rearrange his charts. We need to burn them. You know, we need to use them for our bird cages, like one of the guys said that he does. Uh, you know, and that that's what we need to use them for because he has muddied the waters bad where we are not having a conversation just clearly interpreting what the Bible says. We're we're going into some weird murky waters here. Hey, thank you, Tommy. Why don't we wrap it up there? We are in um, actually, I guess the question was for you, Nick, originally. So to keep to the format that we always do here, did you want a, uh, a quick final word or response to that, Nick? Yeah, I would just say that I am open to being corrected. Um, I previously did not think that the falling away was a departure. Um, I heard this when I was first a Christian in the 1990s, and I rejected it. And I believe that it was a falling away from the faith because I, I was told that by many people. But when I got rid of the falling away, the great falling away, the great falling away from the faith and got rid of all these other words and just saw it as a departure, it just made perfect, clear sense to me. And I can't unsee it now. Um, just like I've done many other studies in the King James, most King James people agree with me and say, wow, you, you've done a really good job at studying words like Easter, words like many other words in the Bible. And so when it comes to this, I'm putting in the effort to show that this is a reasonable explanation and so i don't think it's kooky land i don't think i have anything to do with peter ruckman um I, I but i understand that they are usually your enemy so that's fine you know um I, I don't mind being labeled that but um at the end of the day i think i am thinking for myself yes but um i think your position is different to ken hovine's it's different to donnie's it's different to uh, another pastor who i won't mention who's a friend of yours um there are differences and so it's not like this one cohesive thing. And you're saying pre-tribbers aren't cohesive with all their beliefs. I'm listening to a whole bunch of stuff here. And well, he said it was, you know, Sarah was the woman. He says it's this other person was the woman. This one says Eve is the woman. This one says oh, it's the, the church. This one's saying this. And, and so there's, there are differences. And so I would just say um, take what I'm saying on its individual merits and not um, try and try to pigeonhole me. All right. Well, and that's the point, though. Most of what we've talked about tonight is opinion it's speculation here's where the bible's clear and this is what everybody's got to get a hold of here here's where the bible's clear jesus is coming back it's in the future you know and you know uh where 
do not accept anyone as the Messiah. That's where the Bible's crystal clear. And that's where the Bible is dogmatic. That's where the fight was in the Bible's day. And where we are fighting today is um, basically a, an I am of Paul and I am of Apollos type thing. Because, um, you know, we have, obviously we're naturally curious about these things as we should be. Work, you know, it's exciting. It's something we should be looking into. The problem is people have wrote books, they've wrote charts, and everybody's fighting to prove their theory is better than the next theory. But at the end of the day, when we start speculating, yeah, and no, listen, I'll probably get, I'll probably get my hide nailed for what I've said about Daniel's 70th week and all that. Yeah. Hey, I, I and again, if you want to make a chart, that's fine. I'm telling people, stop calling it Daniel's 70th week. That's about Jerusalem. I mean, every one of those charts is Daniel's 70th week and they have global events on there. The events of Revelation are global events. Daniel 70th week, everything in Daniel 9, everything. Jerusalem, Holy City, it's about Jerusalem. Matthew 24, it's, it's, it's about Jerusalem. Jesus prophesying about Jerusalem, the temple. Why are we doing that? Because we're all trying to improve on what Larkin did. And Larkin was a heretic. Larkin, Larkin was a nut. And I'm saying, you know what? We don't know for sure as much as we think when it comes to this stuff, but let's keep talking about it. Let's have conversations about these things. Let's let's start doing a better job of finding out where the Bible is clear and where um, or what's spelled out in the Bible and what's speculation. And, uh, you know, historically, I mean, we aren't even anywhere close to where people used to be when it comes to eschatology. And I think that's for a reason. I actually think we do know more than they used to know on that because, uh, you know, you go, you read Eusebius. Uh, I think it was, uh, I was just reading it the other day. One of the things that he said in there, he just kind of accepted by faith that revelation was a part of uh, the canon of the scripture, but he didn't understand it. And how would he have been able to understand it? You know, how would the early church fathers been able to understand these things? So, um, you know, we're all, we're all developing this, but for some reason, it seems to me like in the seventies, people got locked into this pre-trib stuff. I've been seeing a guy, he's been cracking me up in the comments. It's like saying how Lindsay, you did this, John Hagee, you did this. And it's true. The thief in the night movies, these things, a lot of this stuff was before I was born. It like people, I mean, a lot of well-known independent fundamental Baptists used to have very differing opinions when it came to eschatology, but somewhere in the seventies, everyone agreed. It was this, this version of the pre-trip that really the modern version of dispensational pre-tribulation rapture is actually different than this. In a lot of areas, the, the, the terminology it's, it's developed, it's morphed. Uh, there's still way too many similarities, but um, it's, it's got to where people, who can't make any coherent sense on a lot of things are like breaking fellowship, uh, declaring people heretics, all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and it just seems like really carnal junk. And even people in the post-trib camp, they lose their minds. You know, if you don't agree with them on Daniel's 70th week, uh, people have tried to tell me that certain pastors like Matt first are so much worse than pre-tribbers because he thinks that the seals have been happening through church history. That's just, that's dumb. That doesn't, what in the world, you know, and that uh, what he's teaching could possibly lead someone to believe in an imminency. So what we're all supposed to be ready for the coming of Christ, but um, you know, it, I, I, I'm just here tonight, not to cause confusion, but to just say, let's take another look at what is clear and what's speculation and we all do it and we of course we're going to do it we want to know what it's going to be like but when we're still we're did you know where people are still baptist preachers are still getting up in their pulpits and talking about rapture coming any moment and you're just gonna disappear your clothes are gonna drop to the floor where do you where'd you get that from that's not in the bible you got that from a thief in the night movie you got that from the Left Behind books. They got it from the Thief in the Night 
movie. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach we're going to disappear. What it does teach is we're going to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. But if we talk about the change like the Bible does instead of the disappearing, well, the problem that's going to cause, that's going to cause us to no longer separate that blessed hope from the glorious appearing, which is what uh, Tim LaHaye does in his book. He separates the blessed hope from the glorious appearing. That doesn't make any sense. The Bible says uh, that we're going to be like him at his appearing. Over and over, the, the appearing is the rapture, but they know that we can't call it that because if we do that, we're going to connect it to Matthew 24. We're going to connect it to all these places. They don't want us connecting it. And I'm, I'm just calling on people to actually check what's Bible and stop, you know, trying to make the scriptures fit your favorite chart because all the charts are, are tainted by Larkin. And proof of that is they say the tribulation, the great tribulation and Daniel's 70th week. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's a mistake and I don't hate people who have put Daniel's 70th week on their charts. I don't hate people who call him the tribulation. If I hear a post-tribber talk about the tribulation, I know what he's talking about. I, you know, if I hear a pre-tribber talk about the tribulation, I know what they're talking about. Uh, but I do know they speak two different languages and that's why pre-tribbers always accuse me of being a mid-tribber. Well, we're speaking two different languages. I, I want to, I, I, you know, I think we need to stop calling it even because you see, even when you say post trip, a lot of people think seven years, I think pre wrath is better because we're out of here for God's wrath. But again, the tribulation to act like we haven't been in tribulation for the last 2000 years is an insult to persecuted Christians throughout history and that are in the world today. It's an insult to them. And I think we, I think we need to get away from that. I think we need to get back to Bible terminology and that will lead us away from stealing all of Larkin's terms and trying to make them fit our better charts. Thank you, pastor. Nick, any final words, final thoughts from you before we uh, wrap it up for the night? Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, I would encourage everyone to read the Bible with an open mind. Um, I would encourage people to study, do word studies. Um, there's nothing wrong with going to the Greek. Um, the King James translators certainly were fluent in Greek. Uh, there's a lot of pastors who are fluent in Greek. And, and um, I know that there is a part of King James Onlyism that sort of says you, you can't really go to the Greek. And I'm not part of that crew. Um, I'm part of Bible translation work from the Texas Receptus. And I do follow the King James Bible. I believe it is the final Texas Receptus. Um, it is the, the, the Scrivener did a pretty good job at sort of um, pu putting it into Greek, but he didn't do a perfect job. But we can look at a lot of these Greek words and we can find out where they appear elsewhere and how they're translated and, and things like that. And so there's nothing wrong with doing that. And when we do these type of studies, uh, when we no, obviously not going to, you know, heretical definitions and things like that, looking at absolutely everything and weighing up things. And also using the King James translators as a guide because they were very superior to us in this generation. So we can see how they translated things and go, wow, that's a good definition. So the word forsake uh, for apostasy there in um, the book of Acts, forsaking Moses just means a departure, an exodus. And so things like that, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Um, and I would also just encourage people to, uh, to go back through this debate and go through each point that I've made and debunk them and, and you contact me and say, Nick, you're wrong here, you're wrong there, and prove me wrong. Um, I will gladly correspond with you. And I'm going to be jumping into eschatology uh, pretty deep in the next um, few months. And so um, I'll gladly chat with you. I'm going to be doing live videos and all the rest of it. And so I'll talk about anything that's been mentioned here uh, in this debate. And um, I will debate anyone on the planet um, about the pre-trib rapture. Okay, Nick and Tommy, again, thank you for an excellent debate. Very interesting back and forth. As always, a, a lot of fun in the audience Q&A. So you never know where the Q&A uh, sections of these debates are going to go uh, based on the questions we get. So I do want to thank everybody in the audience for tuning in, for also being so engaged in this great rapture debate. So again, uh, Pastor Tommy, Nick, thank you so much for your time. 
basically three hours of your time. So I do appreciate that. And also uh, to the audience, if you want to see more from Tommy McMurtry or you want to see more from Nick Sayers, please check the description box of this debate and you'll find the relevant links to their websites and also their YouTube channel. So with that, Standing for Truth is out. God bless all. Yeah.